very good morning and welcome to a beautiful snow basin resort here in wonderful Utah. I'm here with Jack Barr, my name is Steve Hammond, and we have the three mighty boys in the booth that we're going to throw to you very, very shortly. But first, Jack, this place is amazing. You've uh, had a good look at the course. I ran it yesterday and um, got some good uh, men and women coming here what's what's your take yeah it, it seeing this in person versus on the youtube covers last year it, it, this is a very intimidating course i hope these athletes know what they're getting themselves into the biggest story in my opinion lindsey webster is not going to be here it's been over 1500 days since somebody other than lindsey webster or nicole miracle has finished first place in a national series race on the women's side neither of them are there we're gonna see a new champion for the first time in almost five years or over four years. So my guess, Emma Cook Clark's probably gonna run away with it. She's been so dominant. She's done a couple trail races recently, beating Lindsay um, head to head. She she's been right there throughout the throughout the year. Um, second place, that's gonna be where the real battle is. You've got Chris Roglowski, Alex Walker, Rose Wetzel, and Rhea Koval. Any of them could finish in there. My gut. Chris Roglowski is just going to continue doing what she's doing, surprising us all. I think at this point, everyone should just, you know, buy into the hype. She's not a fluke. Everything that she's done this year has been amazing. And she's going to keep doing that, um, riding that momentum. I guess Alex Walker, third place. How about you on the women? Absolutely. I think you're bang on for the top five there. Um, again, anything can kind of happen on this uh, this type of course. But, uh, you know, Emma Cook Clark, let's just talk about her for a second. Cause she's just come off a Sky Race win in Canada. Beating Lindsay Webster by quite 10, 11 a, minutes. That, by, that's by a 11 minutes. Margin. But that was on um, super steep, um, very technical running, yep. which emulates a little bit of what's going up here. So even with Lindsay, be, you know, she's not here, but even if yep. she was here, I I would pick Emma over that. I think she's going to wow. go up very hard. Yep. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if she sneaks in top 10 in the men. Um, yeah. Very, very powerful. Talking about the men, though. Yep. Um, you know, this was the kind of race that showcased uh, Hawk Call last year, uh, Ryland Shadeg, that they've both done extremely well in yep. the uh, um, so far. So Ryland literally lives just over that mountain there. So this is his you home see race. His house right there. Uh, you, you know, just over, yeah. over, over, over in yeah, yeah. Um Josiah Medell, and then of course you got, you know, the Ryan the and usual. BJ yeah. uh, battle. Yep. Um, Anyone else that you're kind of you got your eye on? I, I think you, we saw this in Mexico. You saw the home field advantage that you talked about. It, for the men's race specifically, you only had four athletes from the U.S. or Canada in the top 10 in Mexico. And that home field advantage really paid off. Like you mentioned, Hawk and Ryland, they're right here. They live in Utah. This is their terrain. I think that that's going to work in their advantage a ton. You can't go against VJ until that man does not podium. I don't see how you can leave him out of the top three, even no. though he got his first ever beast podium ever with his win in Mexico recently. He's still not proven at distance, but he's been so good for so long. You can't go against him. Atkins won the course last year. He's the obvious pick to win, but there are a couple people, uh, Josiah Midaw, Tyler Veerman, and my dark horse. I think you're going to see a guy go to the front pretty early. His name's Brett Hales. Um, good mountain you, runner. Yeah, US, absolutely. US national team. Exactly. There yep. you go. And the uh, Spartan development team yep. uh, that we're bringing through the ranks. Travis is another guy. Yep, Travis Fuller. Uh, Travis Fuller, local guy, very good runner, yep. same coaches, um, Hawk Corn. Just, just bringing these guys into the field, just kind of... Uh, Mix you, things up. Yeah, it, for it, the first half, you might see these guys be in the top 10, be there battling out, and yep. uh, that could ruffle some feathers. You saw that with uh, Joshua McAdams last year, just in podium contention. Yep. Weird things happen in races like this, yep. specifically in Utah. Um, back to that guy, Brett, real quick, though. Him, He and Josiah have both won a national Xterra championship at Snow Basin. Yeah. So that familiarity with the terrain, it, you know, they've proven themselves at roughly a half marathon distance in the past. They haven't done it at the Spartan race. But, but I they've done be, it here. They've done it literally yeah. here. And I think that that's going to um, Two very different courses, though. That yes. is over on Sardine Peak, yep. and we're over on the main peak. I ran it yesterday. Uh, we were a little bit over on the mileage. We uh, did some adopted yesterday of, uh, of the course. So we're back to about 13.7 miles. Sure. But it didn't really take any of the elevation gain away. Oh. So we are about 37, 3,800, which is about oh. 200 more, 300 more than last year, 3,500 last year. Most of that's front-loaded, it seems. Mate, 
Yeah. The first eight and a half miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It how, many, how many gators do you have for us to catch up with everybody? Like, uh, yeah. Hopefully all of them. Yeah. Um, uh, really, really technical running of some. Well, actually, you know what? It's got a bit of everything. It's got yeah. some of the best single track that I've ever seen at a Spartan race. Yeah. It's got some super steep downs, super steep down. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of. You have a lot of this flesh that you see on the ground. Like that's that's pretty Dude, common. There's a there. lot of there's a lot of stuff in the first half. Uh-huh. Then um, a little bit different from last year, but it meanders this beautiful top section. It's one of my favorite yeah. parts of the course. For about three or four miles, it does a lot of meandering. Some of the first kind of half as well. You've got a couple of steep hills thrown yep. in, and then it's very fast single tracks. So you'll be seeing some five minute miles thrown in in the first couple of miles and then probably in the back half as well coming yeah. down if they've got much legs in um we have in the past you know johnny luna lima kind of descends and that's where people like that like so you know tyler veerman can descend ryland they can descend Josh Ryan Reading here, another yeah, guy. Tom, yep. dude like yeah um he can really really descend yep. um it's very technical. After stairway, just keep an eye out on maybe a couple of changes yeah. there because over a section of about a mile, mm-hmm. it's, there's these big like baby head rocks that's super technical to run. And if some of these you know, quick sort of flatter trail runs, if you're used to running something like Sardine Peak, it's not like this, running this that. Completely different area. They might yeah. put the brakes on. We will see. Yeah. And that's kind of very, very exciting to see. Good gauntlet area down yeah. below. Um, again, no sort of tire flip, um, but there's a stout, it's just, just here actually, yeah. is the uh, multi-rig, and it comes in. Um, it's a little bit more spread out, I feel, compared yeah. to last year. Last year, we had this kind of... You're saying um, getting into the final mile. Yeah, it's, it's final mile skating. is a little bit more okay. spread out. And yeah. so... If you had to um, make your move, where would you do it? Sandbag. Sandbag. Yeah. Most important part? Oh, uh, yeah. Sandbag is a good, good yeah. decent sandbag. Like Later last in the year. race than last year. Uh, same oh, place as last year, oh, but it's okay. just more spread out at the bottom. Because we finish here in this great amphitheater. Yeah. You run right past the finish line, yeah. go all the way down, hit the spear. It's flat this time. Okay. <laughs> Not shooting up here. Nice and easy. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's a spear. We're, we're, yeah. It's a spear. Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, down, down you come, back up. And yep. uh, and then we've got this beautiful uh, yep. amphitheater to finish right here. All right, and Steve, one last thing. It's hot out here. Last year, after the race, Ryan Atkins told everybody, you can't use this heat as, a, as an excuse. Everybody knew it was coming. So we're going to try to see, will people make the same mistake and go out a little too hot and pay the price later because of the heat? Or will they make some adjustments? Heat mitigation is as important as yep. trail running training yep. or strength training. So important because, you know, you need your electrolytes, you need your water in you, you'll get people out with the hydration packs. That is absolutely imperative. If you've not been hydrating, you're already yeah, behind the curve. Definitely. Like, um, but rate, like, during the race as well. And Don't skip a single wa- water stage. Even, no. if it's, even if you have to walk 10 seconds off to the side, do it because you're going to pay the price later. We saw that last year with so many top athletes. Be prepared. So it's warm out here, guys. Very, very warm. We're going to have an exciting race. Yeah. Back to you, boys. It's going to be exciting. We'll see you all there. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the fourth race in the Spartan North American Elite Series and the first full-length live broadcast by the OCR Report. We'll be bringing you nonstop live coverage of today's race from Soul Basin Resort in Utah. And, yes, we do apologize but they have kicked off this race already. That is the women's race that you're seeing at the front. The men just a few minutes ahead of them. I'm David Megida, and today I'm joined in the booth by two men you should know quite well, Racken Crocker and Kirk DeWint of the Running Public Pop- Podcast. If you can't be out there racing, this is the next best thing, gentlemen. So, Kirk, you've raced at Snow Basin Resort before. What should these athletes expect as you see Chris Wiglowski climbing right now? I sure have. And this course on paper uh, sometimes doesn't even look as difficult as it is in person. Um, this, this course is exposed. You see these courses out east and they got more foliage and dense and shade. Uh, this course is not going to let those athletes hide at all today. Um, so as soon as these shadows kind of peek back over the mountain, you're going to see a lot of sun. You're going to see a lot of sweat. And you're going to see a, just the, the overall volume of this effort start to catch up with the athletes. But 
Um, you have a lot of runnable climbs, but then you have real short, punchy stuff that is going to require even like the best people to be power hiking. So it's a really good mixed course, a little more bushwhacky than you would expect a, uh, a like sort of a West Coast course to be. But um, you can still run fast at points. So it's going to be a good, uh, good thing to see shake out today. And I would add that the air is tremendously dry out here. It's dusty. So it's there's low humidity. So it's not like those courses where you're getting a lot of that humidity in the air. Like this is a, it's a dusty, dry, rough climb. Elevation and heat are a huge factor in this race today. Bracken, you've you've analyzed this course map from top to bottom. So let's take a minute and we'll, we'll go over some of the differences between this course and the course from last year, where you think our athletes have an opportunity to make a move. As you can see, already a lot of hiking in the women's field as they're on that first climb. Well, what this course for in the past is a massive climb, a massive descent at the super distance, and two to three big massive at the beast distance. And this we kind of ramp in. You get a, a climb, but it's not massive. It's a shorter climb, short descent, medium climb, medium descent, and then back to back, massive climb, massive descent. And that can lull people into either a false sense of security or over revving early because, hey, I hopped this first climb and it wasn't that bad. And so even more than last when we saw people, it's going to be a second half race. Well, there's no question uh, the climbing in the second half of this race is going to be one of the big dangers. The other thing is this course is, is a bit more bushwhacky, and you can see that. That's hot call right there with the pirate booty. And there's a lot more of running through brush and roots and not being able to necessarily see your feet. There's bushes overgrown on a lot of the climbs over the rocks and on the descents on this course for those of us who have run out here at Snow Basin Resort. And it does add a little extra element of danger to it, of fatigue to it, and of misery to this course. Yeah, yeah this, what I like seeing here are courses. Um, oh, you go ahead, Brian. Obstacles are the biggest issue. This course, the course is the biggest issue. Between the elevation, the heat, and the nasty terrain, that is going to be what the athletes are battling the most. Obviously, the obstacles matter, and the gauntlet at the end will be a game changer, but it will be because of what we're going to do to these athletes by the time they get there. Now, you can usually get past one issue maybe too but when you have heat altitude and a brutal course it really strips people down to only the fitness they brought there and the strategy they enact on their way up and down this mountain and this is hawk call in the lead and, and last year it was his debut in the north american elite series everyone was saying oh this is hobie call's son hobie call's son well this is not just that this is a man who ran to a podium finish in this race, and he did it by front-running the race, just like he is today so far, with Tyler Veerman right behind him, who's been putting in a ton of long hours in the mountains, and Josiah Middow as well, who we mentioned before, has a lot of experience Xterra racing on this exact mountain, has won here on this mountain before. Ryland Shadeg following him in the blue, Ryland finishing second on this course last year in what was his North American Championship debut as well. Yeah, and as you'll see, I mentioned and so who a else bunch of bushwhacking, see? or more bushwhacking than you would typically expect. But we did have the Ultra Beasters go off first, and so as you saw that shot of Hawk Call going up the uh, up the ski run, there was a trail already pounded into the grass. So lucky for these guys and girls, there was a whole host of sacrificial lambs that went through and carved a trail beforehand. <laughs> so uh, maybe a little bit less uh, scratched up legs because courtesy of the Ultra Beasters. I don't know. I guess we'll see. And one thing that was mentioned is that the top of this course, when they get there, they'll meander around a bit. And at the top of this course, there'll be a bunch of rolling, great visuals. And I would say one of the most stunning views that you will have of any course out there when you get to the top and you're running rock to rock along the ridge line. Um, well worth the payoff on this one in particular. But it's, of course, just a brief reprieve because there are some of the nastiest climbing. Uh, in the second half of this race. 
Dave, I want to get right to two things that we are already seeing play out on the scores, and that is aggression on the men's side and aggression on the women's side. Now, Emma is just doing her thing and getting to the front, but Chris Roglowski went right on her tail to begin with, immediately gapped the field, and by the time they hit the power hiking sections, you saw Rose Wetzel already catching her. Now, Chris has proven to be pretty much indestructible this year, but the last thing you want to do with heat, altitude, and nasty course is over rev even a little bit. And then on the men's side, we saw Hawk Call do this last year and then implode at the end. But he truly imploded at the, the tire flip, and there is no tire flip waiting for him this year. So it looks as if he took all that data from last year, analyzed it, and said, I can do it again. There is a coins for it this year, and the rest of the field has to react to that accordingly. And speaking of Hawk Call, there he is. And right before you caught a shot of Emma Cook Clark descending on that single track, and she does look incredibly strong, not just as a climber, but she's been such a strong descender as well. In Big Bear, she was actually putting distance between herself and Lindsay Webster on those descents. Um, and then also making a lot of gap or forming a lot of gap coming in and out of each obstacle. She had a little more giddy up and pep to her step that day. And we're seeing her really come into her own as a racer. As again, that's Tyler Veerman. This section right here, this is a similar spot to where this uh, vertical cargo net was placed last year. It heads into another steep climb as they come out of this, a long grind. Uh, and it starts to get a little rockier and more rubble as we move further up the mountain. I like seeing Tyler Veerman being aggressive here. I know in the past, Tyler has, uh, what, what we'll say, gone out a little too hard and then paid the the price later in the race. We've seen him do it a few years ago mm -hmm. at a Big Bear Nat Series race. But I do feel like he is in better fitness now. And if I'm Tyler, like, I'm out here with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. He didn't have a great showing in San Luis Obispo. He had a missed spear and was disappointed with his finish. And I kind of already see him just grabbing this race by the horns and saying, all right, I'm going to put myself in contention. He's a more tenured racer now. I think he knows his fitness better. And I think uh, seeing Tyler Veerman up there, not necessarily surprised. And I don't think we're going to see a Tyler Veerman blow up uh, if I'm going to make any shots right now. I think this is a real move he's making to stay up towards the front. I, I would have to agree with you, Kirk. And, and the big thing here is that Veerman has been putting in a lot of three, four, five-hour runs in the mountains. He, did, he ran his first official marathon a couple weeks ago, except it was a mountain marathon. Uh, the, the guy has been putting in tremendous amounts of volume. And even if he's doing a hard workout in the morning, you see him getting two to three hours uh, in the mountains in the evenings. I don't think the elevation, the incline, or the distance is going to be a problem for him. If anything is going to be an issue for any of these athletes, I think it's going to be the impact of the heat in the second hour of this race. Yeah, with Tyler, the 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 story on him was always he's a kind of a freakish athlete. He has a circus background in college, so he's super fast twitch. He can explode and do things, but he would blow up in races. Well, over the last year, mm -hmm. he's become an ultra athlete. He took second at the 24-hour Spartan Ultra Championships, and so that threat has kind of been removed from the rest of the field in terms of, well, he'll blow up. And secondly, seeing Rylan already up in the top three is also really bad news for people because last year he closed on this course. He was the new guy mm -hmm. to the scene, and he power hiked and descended his way onto the podium when people were cracking. Now he's in position for a podium before the second half even starts. And what we're seeing right now, you're, you're getting visuals of the women's race, and that was Rose Wetzel making her way over the inverted wall, followed by, I believe that was a uh, Rhea Koval sighting. Yep, and what you're seeing here is like, you know, some of this terrain that you're watching, these these guys and girls go through like doesn't steep visually on camera well first of all like i feel like the camera takes away percent gradient on everything so everything's probably more steep than it appears and then the other thing is like a lot of this first climb and the second climb is what you call that douche grade. It's like it's like that annoying in which you still need to run hard and fast and almost kind of open up and i think it's the most painful grade to run i think power hiking steep terrain is tough uh, of course, running fast and flat is tough, but then you have that 10%, that 5% that just requires you to still form. 
and run fast. And I think that's the most painful type of running you can do. Again, just my personal opinion, but that's what you're seeing Emma do right now is just that, that like annoyingly, that annoying grade of running. Can you guys relate to that? Yeah, that, that 8%, it's not the same as doing it on a treadmill either, because you're talking about undulated terrain and uneven footing. And so you're losing a lot of that foot to ground power on that climb. So the energy required is significantly higher. And one of the athletes who's always been very strong with that is Rhea Koble, who we saw right there, looked very comfortable climbing. I think all that schemo training is clearly paying off for her. Yeah, we haven't seen Rhea up in contention early in a race in a while, and this is her terrain. High altitude, steep courses. She is one of those athletes that when others power hike, she just shortens her stride and keeps running. And that'll be interesting to see. And David, a, a minute or two earlier, you alluded to the heat and kind of walked us into that. The interesting thing about racing in the heat is that it doesn't affect you until it does. Like you can run a mm -hmm. great workout in the heat. You can run a great first half of a race. You can even keep your whole race and run a great heat race. But the moment you start to crack, it's compounding interest all at once. And so a lot of these athletes are going to look good for a while and they are going to be looking like themselves right up until the moment they don't. And it leads you to maybe I'll skip a water station or I'm going to close this gap and get right up there because other people are hurting already. And you don't really get the bill until the second half of the race. So a lot of people look good, but will they? Well, it's, it's completely true that what's going to happen is a lot of times in a race, if your heart rate gets too high, you have this opportunity somewhere on a downhill, you can pull it back under control. But if you overheat on a course like this today, it is unlikely that you're going to find the opportunity to bring that temperature back into control. As far as I recall, there are no major water crossings on this course. There's not a lot of opportunities to cool off, especially as you start to hit some of these other long climbs. And because you're working so hard on that climb, the change in temp isn't really going to be that helpful. As again, Emma Cook Clark is in that gravelly uphill grind that we were just talking about, where it's runnable that entire time, but you can hold an uncomfortable pace. And right here, Rose Wetzel making a pass over the tabletop in the vertical cargo. Think about what we saw yeah, last right year uh, towards towards the end of the race last year. We saw, uh, who is it, Annie Doobie, who came down from the rope climb the second half of the race and almost looked like she was going to tip over. We saw a hot call, fire, and then looked like he had a few too many beverages afterwards for the next 30 seconds or so. What Bracken is talking about, that heat and catching up with you on the backside, like that is a very real thing. And so what I'm wondering as we watch like Ray Cobo, Rose Wetzel go up this climb, we saw Hot Call go out hard up front. Emma Cook Clark has a gap. Do you think any of these athletes are already consciously thinking of that as they run in the nice shadows of the morning? If they're not, I they should so. be. I, one of the things worth noting is that this uh, predicted temperature today is five to six degrees less than last season. Uh, so when we we look at this course, the temperatures won't be quite as impactful, but it is still going to be pretty warm, expected to be about 80 by the time these athletes are finishing the race. I'd like to point out that that's Rose Wetzel was running in the red right there, looking very strong compared to previous years. I, her fitness is clearly coming back. You're seeing especially on the climbing. She has been so powerful today and smooth thus far coming in and out of obstacles on the climbs i've noticed it a couple times already and i think you're going to see a new fitness level for her this year versus previous years she's going to look like the rose wetzel of old look at this on the right side here you just saw one of the ultra beast athletes get passed by hawk and he was using his hands the camera never does it justice like kirk says it slows everything down and it flattens the mountain but you can't fake this. This is so steep. And these are the rhythm breakers. You could be in such a good uphill running rhythm and suddenly you have to use all of your quad and all of your hamstring and then you've got to engage your arms and you never quite get back to your best stride again after that. It dings you a little bit. And every single one of these sections, it dings you and dings you and it reduces you down and reduces you down. And you combine that with the heat. And I don't want to overplay how brutal this is, but it is really going to wear on these athletes. And what you're seeing right now, this power hiking from Tyler Veerman up this climb, this is an incredibly steep climb. This is probably a 25 to 30% incline, possibly more, but it's also very uneven. This was overgrown tremendously last year 
when we ran on this course. It's still a bit. You're seeing a lot of that brush up against his legs, but there's a path that's carved through it a bit, so it's a bit more stable. That's a very long, nasty, steep climb, and he's made light work of it. Like, could he look more comfortable coming up this top of this climb? I'm not sure. Well, let's talk strategy here, okay? So what are, what are your two thoughts, uh, Brack? And I'll kick to you. Like, you know, for me, I find that it's more efficient to keep a run stride for me. I find when I break into a power hike, for example, and try to keep the same pace, my heart rate actually goes up. So when I go to a power hike, it actually slows me down a little. And that's the only way my heart rate's coming back down. Now you have the other side of the camp, like a Ryan Atkins, who I'm sure will take these big, big, long power hiking strides at every chance he gets. We saw Hawk Call run up the entire thing with those short, choppy, choppy strides. Uh, Brad, what's your school of thought on on one versus the other? Uh, it's you got to have a plan. You have to be familiar with when to run and when to hike. And if you look at the front of this race, we have Hawk Call, Utah Elevation Mountains. You have Rose Wetzel, Rhea Koble, Tyler Veerman, Josiah Mitta, all in Colorado mountains and altitude. Emma can train in the mountains, but she doesn't live at altitude. She's kind of the outlier here, but second through probably eighth on the women's side and first through probably 10th right now in the men's. Everyone we've seen are all altitude mountain livers other than Mark Botris and Emma Cook-Clark. So they are all intimate and they hike when they run. And that's the only way to get through it. Otherwise you caught power hiking for way too long and you lose ground or you run for too long and you burn your legs out. I do apologize. We're having some brief technical I don't know how much of that out there in the mountain. It is easy to lose that service signal. Kirk, were you yep, able to hear the, the power hike and run in chat? Uh, yep, caught up on that for the most part. Bits and pieces, okay. Bracken. So there's our we'll, first we'll look at Ryan we'll Atkins. Me. Yeah. Ryan finally gets to use his legs here. He's been trying to stay within himself. He's been trying to stay up with the group. And now oh, we got Steve Hammond out there Steve. right now on the mountain with an update. Steve, take it away. We'll continue to call it until we get Steve on air. But right now you just saw they are up near the top of the mountain. There'll be some descending going on. And that's uh, an opportunity to really shake things up because they've been climbing for the majority of the first 20 or 25 minutes of this race. And here's yeah, so the depressing part Clark, for a lot uh, of athletes. I'm sorry, Kirk, but we just went past Olympus. Olympus is obstacle eight, which means they are just beginning the big climb. So what we've seen so far was the little climb and the medium climb. And we have Steve Hammond actually out there this time with us. Steve, give us an update. Oh my goodness me, the uh, steep hill really came into fruition just then with uh, um, Olympus just at the top. They've got this huge descent all the way down to Strawberry Lodge down the bottom just now. So, um, amazing, amazing scenes here really. Um, Josiah Medell doing extremely well, Hawk Call um, way out in the lead, looking super, super strong. Ryan Atkins just came into fourth position there. Um, Brett Halls, who was like in fourth position, he just failed um, Olympus. Um, he's just done the penalty loop. He's just gone past. Um, so your top five is, I believe, um, Hawk Call, Tyler Veerman, um, Ryland Shadeg now, um, Ryan Atkins, and Brett Halls. There's your top five right now. 
and uh, <laughs> looking looking pretty amazing up here. So we've got a huge descent, and they're going to come right back up to me up here. I'm going to catch them on the uh, uh, the ascent, um, guys. It's very, very hot here, very hot down in the valley, a little bit cooler up here in the wind, um, but they're going to be going up and running up in the hills up here, a little bit cooler. But fantastic scenes here. Back to you guys. Thanks, Steve, for the update. And I think the most interesting thing about what just happened there, one, you have Ryan Atkins doing what he does, which is that slow grind to climb himself back into a race, never going out too hot. But Brett Hall's still being in the top five after doing burpees or taking a penalty at Olympus, that is. That goes to tell you just how strong those lead men have been climbing compared to the rest of the field. Because right now you're getting a view of what looks to be Josiah Middow flying downhill right behind Ryland Shadeg. Now, typically, I like to see it. You know, you see um, Josiah Middow. He tends to uh, lead these mountain races early on, or likes to lead these mountain races early on. And then sometimes he starts to drift back just a little towards the end, right? We have our heavy closers, you know, our VJs, our Atkins, our Rylands, and somehow he ends up getting nipped towards the end. I actually feel like that version of Josiah we're looking at there is holding back just a little bit, maybe based on past experiences and some recent lessons learned on how to true race a Spartan mountain race properly. And then you have Ryland Shadig, who he's following very closely behind, who I would say is actually going out harder than I expected him to, because Ryland is traditionally known as a closer. At least he's built up that sort of um, uh, facade. So anyway, so I just think it's an interesting combo. I think we have like a Josiah who's holding back. And then we have a Ryland who's being more aggressive, yet they're both right next to each other on the mountain. Uh, what do you think about their positioning bracket? Well, it is very interesting. And we saw Ryland blow right around him as they started descending. But Josiah's not going anywhere. And and you know me. I always look into what athletes are doing, what they're wearing. And historically, Josiah races in either Solomon's soft ground pros or he races in the Hoka Evo Jaws, which are both aggressive stripped down racers. Today, he's in the Tecton X from Hoka, which is a beefier cushion shoe, which tells me he's not prioritizing speed on this course. He's playing the long game. And that plays right into what you're saying, Kirk, which is he's not looking to rip up the first climb and descent. He's looking to rip up the final climb and descent. And Bracken, I would add that you're spot on with that. When you look at the actual descents on this course, they're long, but they can also be steep. And I recall the course here a couple years ago where the descent, one of the final descents was uh, somewhere in the mile and a half long range. And mm -hmm. what I noticed from my body running the course was that my quads were giving out towards the end of that descent. Because uh, you're having this massive effort, high impact. You either have to be able to continue to allow the feet to turn over on these descents and not break at all. Or if you're breaking in any way, as you see, I'm a Cook Clark go by, very happy. Uh, if you're breaking at all, your quads are firing tremendously hard on that descent. And at some point, they may give out. Either way, the bottoms of your feet are taking a beating because it's rocky and rubbly on the way down some of these climbs. Yeah, they're descending really steep stuff right now on the women's side, and the men are getting that rolling smooth terrain. But they're taking a long descent to the to the bottom. Then they have a bigger climb, and then we get to what you were talking about. They descend from mile five and a half to seven, climb back all the way up, and then from mile 10 to the finish, they're descending again. Now that one's a little more broken. So they have a mile and a half descent and a broken two and a half mile descent. Which means you can't overplay those cards and a half early. Descent, no, that mile and a half descent, we're looking at a, a very steep, painful descent. Kind of the, the kind of descent that you might get more in like a big bear, but more rubble involved. Uh, and then as far as that, those other descents, it may be a little bit stretched out and winding. And of course, having those kickers in the middle to, to break them up allows you to let those quads and the bottoms of those feet get a reprieve. But again, those cushion shoes you mentioned going to play a huge role here today. Kirk, again, you've raced on this course. What are your thoughts looking at this one? Yeah, speaking of steep, uh, fellas, 
that may be the first time I had seen Rhea Copel power hiking up a mountain. Let's go, I don't know if you caught that previous Focus. shot, but you know it's <laughs> steep when Rhea Copel is power hiking because that girl can run up mountains. So just as we were about uh, the train being steep, if Rhea Copel is power hiking, folks, it's steep as heck. You can uh, you can rest assured that that is some grade that some of you might be on your hands and knees for. And we right now have a three woman battle for a podium position. Josiah I believe just crashed. This is the competition for what was that bracken did you say josiah crashed yeah he just wiped out on coming around the corner on a descent and rylan is completely off screen out of sight bell. you can get that bell from right there there it is now for those of you wondering because if it's not on screen right now josiah Middow did have a crash but he is back up and running he's not injured he's not out of it uh he's still moving strong as rea Koble now coming out ahead in that group of three but up in front of them, Chris Roglowski still in second position as far as we're aware, with Emma Cook-Clark way out in the lead for the women's race. Traditionally, I feel like the women's race opens up earlier, especially in these big mountain races, right? We see these larger gaps form. And let's be honest, like if we were going to call our shots, we would have guessed that Emma Cook-Clark was going to be way out front even already, right? Uh, she's smiling, laughing, Absolutely. having a good time and still just laying it down. However, you see how tight this pack of women is? Like, we have our main players all sort of already mixing it up. And if they have any chance of keeping Emma Cook-Clark somewhat in sight, they need to kind of battle each other along, right? So that they can keep the intensity up early and maybe just maybe have, like, sort of a fool's hope of, of reeling an Emma at some point. But I like the fact that we have this group of women working together right now. Uh, that's going to pay dividends possibly later as far as closing that gap between them and Emma. And Kirk, I would say that, that when we talk about working together and people maybe don't have the experience or the knowledge to know like the difference between three athletes who are actually trying to help each other along and keep each other pushed versus three athletes throwing attacks at one another, trying to break each other on the course, that's a good way to fall out of contention for the higher podium spots and a good way to blow up. But instead, trying to hold a tempo, drafting on each other, Working together without throwing aggressive attacks is a very different way of, of going about group running. Well, Bracken, you know this, like um, not only are they like trying to keep, you know, let's say first place in sight, but these women also have to think about the ladies following behind them. And some of those women behind these ladies we see here grouped up are gonna be caught in open woman's land, meaning like, they got they can see in front of them. They got nobody they can see behind them. And so it's easy to just slightly back off the throttle. And maybe that'll pay off later in this race. But um, I just like that we sort of see this clumping of ladies who are working together, which not only, you know, again, keeps that gap tight up front, but also maybe puts a little more on from the women behind them. Um, I don't know. How do you see that playing out, Bracken? Do you see it's being too early in this race for that to make a difference? Um, or could this, in fact, maybe even be hurting them if they're pushing each other a little early? I mean, it certainly could be because you get pushed outside of your comfort zone just slightly, and that's all it takes at altitude. You know as well as I, if you tip slightly at altitude, you tip. At sea level, you can rein it back in. It's really hard to get it back together. But at the same time, if you are out in front and you are in first, or let's say like Chris is and you're in second, but you've been gapped by first, the last thing you want is a group of people working to catch you you want a single chaser you do not want a peloton well speaking of a uh, little bit of race competition out there on the course jack bauer we have uh, an update from the stats man himself out on the course jack are you with us yes can you hear me david all right yeah um, so right now chris roglowski actually dropped from second to fifth after going out really fast um, Emma, commanding lead. Um, she was chatting, talking the whole time up there. It's like she's out in a fun run. It's insane how, how comfortable she's looking out there. Passed a ton of the guys within the first mile and a half, so she's, she's in cruise control right now. Um, it looked like Rose and Rhea were just behind her, and Jamie Brusa in fourth place. So she was, she's the big surprise at this moment. Fantastic mountain runner, um, but she's probably the, the surprise. Alex Walker in sixth or fifth, um, and then uh, Casey Monroe just after her. But Emma commanding lead, and they're going uh, downhill right now. We're going to catch them on the uphill in a little bit. 
Well, thanks a lot, Jack. And, and you know, I was thinking that that looked like Jamie Brusa, but I was surprised to see her mixing it up that far up in the field with this with the names of the ladies that she was with with rose wetzel and with Rhea Coble. but we've seen jamie have strong performances at courses even like killing uh, killington in the past so we know she has the, the ability to climb but this is her uh in some ways punching a little bit above her weight class and it would be an amazing thing to see her do this the entire length of the race you know what she's going to because what she's showing right now is that she is a class above the women around her on the descents. And we know very well that it doesn't matter how hard you work an uphill if they can gobble you right up on the down. And you saw the difference between her and Rhea. Rhea has that all day, all night type of descending ability. She is never outside her comfort zone. She is always compact. And, but Jamie opens up her hips like we see Ryan Atkins doing on screen from time to time here. A little bit like, like we've seen Rylan or even a Johnny do in the past where she gets some extension and a little bit of arm flailing going to keep her upright that you don't see from someone like Rose or Rhea. And so no matter what they do on obstacles, she's going to downhill herself back into this race all day long. And Rose Wetzel also does want to run that downhill hard, but you can see she's got that slight strategic position in front of Brusa, and she's preventing her from fully opening up because Brusa wants to get by, but she can't run that full speed she wants because it's only a single track. It's a tough place to pass. So Rose is mitigating a little bit of that damage right now, but they are gapping Coble by quite a bit. Yeah, Jack alluded to the fact that you know, Emma Cook Clark uh, very out of breath, which is dangerous for the rest of the field. But uh, I'm more surprised that Jack wasn't more out of breath. I don't know about you guys, but he's got a tall order hanging up there up front with the ladies. So Jack, good job, man. I'm impressed that your fitness is holding up with some of these uh, some of these ladies. Now, what do we see here, uh, David no. or Bracken? Actually, Bracken, since you got a horse. So these ladies are going to descend, right, taking their first big descent here. And then, and then what are we seeing at the bottom? Typically, there's a gauntlet of sorts at the bottom. What are they coming up on? There actually is no gauntlet. They come down to a wall and immediately start up with like a almost a two-mile climb, if I'm reading this math correctly, because that sounds crazy to even say out loud that we're hitting a two-mile climb. But this is the big climb right here. So in my opinion, they get to the bottom, they clear a wall, and the race begins. Everything up until here has just been a preamble. This is foreplay. It's about to get real. You've maybe trashed your legs more than you thought you were going to. Maybe this is good news for Jamie that she can't pass quite yet because she's not allowed to hammer yet because she still has two monster climbs. So we would expect, usually you would come down and do a bunch of obstacles in front of an audience. You stop just short of the festival grounds and go back up right away. I also want to point out something else Jack said, which was that Chris Berglowski went out too fast on the first climb. I think she felt this need to establish herself. I, I, am, I am this upper echelon athlete. Look at all these things I've accomplished this year. And there is some level of that expectation. Like maybe I need to go out and, you know, set my, you know, stamp my mark on this race early and on a course like this you can pay the price early or you can pay the price late and maybe she has a second wind in her but she's already dropped to fifth position which was unexpected speaking of jack we have jack out there with another update i believe uh on the women's race jack take it away Look at how steep it is. It's so difficult to tell on camera. This is probably 40 to 45% grade. With all that high brush that people have to walk through. These are some of the ultra people coming through. Um, but this is going to be a 10, 15 minute climb for the top athletes coming up here. It, it's so hard to tell on camera, but I can assure you this is uh, probably the steepest part of the course that they've hit so far. That's it. Thanks, Jack. If this was the, cl the same climb as last year, that grass will all be pounded into dirt by the time this thing's over. There'll be so many people tracking over it. But it is a miserable, he's right, about 10 to 15 minute climb. Uh, it's The earth kind of gives way beneath you on that climb a little bit. You lose some of that climbing power. 
And so it just kind of drags on. And once you reach the peak of it, you still have more running to do up some trails as well. It's not the top. It's just the, the top of about a half mile worth of very steep climbing. As we're looking at Olympus right now, excuse me, uh, the Tyrolean Traverse right now. And that's Hawk Call still out in the front, but being chased hard by, looks like Josiah Middow. If that's the case, something happened here. If that's truly Hawk in front, and I'm not convinced that's Hawk. Because those shorts looked a little bit long for what Hawk's wearing. So I believe Hawk's still free and clear. But I do want to take a second and shout out two things. First of all, let's get some ultra love out here. This course, it historically has been a massive DNF monster for the ultra crowd. And it's going to be every bit as hot for them as last year. It's going to be a little cooler for the elite beast race at like 80 but we still top out at 99 degrees here. And this course to me looks more brutal than last year. So that alone is going to be a huge task for this crowd today. So congrats to anyone who's out there doing that. But secondly, I don't care if it is single track. If Jamie really wanted to pass, she could be past Rose by now and she's not. So Rose is taking again, her mountain game to the next level because she's had Jamie on her hip for probably five or six minutes straight without a pass attempt. And I think you're seeing Brusa is content to just be connected to her. I mean, whether she's sitting in second or third, they're essentially in that second podium position, and they're working together to establish a gap right now over Rhea Koval. So, you know, we talked before about do you throw attacks against each other or do you work together? This is a perfect example of two athletes content to work together, at least for the time being. There'll be a moment where they're no longer friends, but right now, it's advantageous to both of them to just continue to run a steady pace and not be trying to hurt each other. As you can see, top right, up ahead, it's Josiah Middow climbing, and I believe that was Atkins listed in front of him. Ryan Atkins, uh, also with something on the back of his shorts that made it look like those, uh, that pirate that Hawk Call had as well. But Atkins has slowly worked his way up this course. And again, they're ascending. This is not flat. What you're seeing right now is still a relatively steep climb. It's runnable the entire way. But these athletes have been turning over mostly uphill or downhill for the entirety of this race. Kirk, this is I don't awesome know what we're looking at this. <laughs> because you've, you've raced these guys. I've raced these mm -hmm. guys. You know this game of chess that's happening right here. Ryan says, go ahead and over rev those clams, Josiah. I'm going to take it right back on every descent. And he did. But Josiah just said, okay, you moved your pawn up. I'm going to move mine right back. And he took him at the base of the climb. So now he has two miles roughly to drop Atkins more than Atkins can make up on the subsequent descent. And having, you're a descender yourself. How does that play into your mind? Having someone like Josiah go right back around on every climb. I like the move, man. I really do. I, I think it's easy to pay Ryan Atkins a lot of respect, and he's earned that from the other racers, right? And then for a very tenured racer like Josiah to go out to go out here and just be like, I don't care who you are. I'm gonna go climb. I'm gonna go out climb you, and to do that, and and you have to think like a little bit, right? Like Atkins worked really hard on the descent to get a gap, right? And he made up a lot of placement, and that's his wheelhouse. But then right away to turn around and go up against gravity and have somebody kind of blow right by you. And that's kind of what it looks like. Now it's on, right? Now it's like, all right, does, if I'm Mackins, I'm thinking like, do I want to burn a little bit more of a match to keep him in sight? Or do I let him go and run my own race? Because it is still really early in this race to be like, I don't know, burning only a few, burning a match or two when you don't have that many. So I'm actually very curious to see how this looks on the top of this climb once we get there. It's a master now, class. I, I will say, watching. Kirk, I think it's important I think it's important to note, we've seen these guys battle on a similar mountain course in, in Big Bear a couple times. And both of those times, Josiah went out hard near the front of the pack, Lars Arneson joining him both of those times. But Atkins never allowed those guys to separate from him significantly. In both of those races at Big Bear, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and any gap that they formed, he pulled it back on the descents quickly so that he could then be ready to make a move on the final climb. But he actually outclimbed both of those guys 
on the final climbs each of the last two years, even though VJ took him on one of those. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think what we're watching here is two incredibly seasoned racers match wits. Mm -hmm. No one's raced in the mountains more than Josiah in this field. And if anyone has, it's Ryan Atkins. These two know exactly how to race. But the one thing Josiah is not used to is Spartan race. That's the only thing he's not totally used to. And I believe personally that when he sees Big Bear in the past, it says 10K. It doesn't say Spartan Super to him. It says 10K obstacle race. And he runs it like a 10K. But we all know that a Spartan 10K hits like a 15K. You can't really expect a mountain Spartan to play out with that duration or intensity because of the carries and the grind. And he clearly today is not approaching this the way he approached those last two races. So he's learning on the fly too. And this yo-yoing, Atkins was never in front of him on the first climb. He started the second climb ahead of him. The third climb, his goal is to be maybe halfway up it by the end and then by the final descent down. So he doesn't need to win any of these. He needs to make it further and further each climb ahead of him. So who did we have there? Was that Jamie Brusa doing burpees on the wall? Did she work that? Was that's that what who it, we saw there? Did she work that hard to get up there like. only to... And that's, and that's what it... That's a testament to what does running uphill do to your explosiveness, right? I can think of some of the worst cramps in my life out on the race course when we had an eight foot wall that was uphill and you have to run and jump mm -hmm. up that thing so bad to the point where I fell on my back and rolled around due to calf cramps of all things, which I don't even deal with. Now you have some early in a race who can't get up the wall. And ugh, it makes me feel for it, to be honest, because I've been in that situation where that's tough. And then two, that just changed things that quick. And did you see how quickly it looked like she was wrapping up her 30 burpees when was that Rose or Alex Walker was getting wall. So she lost. I mean, obviously she'd worked pretty hard to get maybe two minutes up on a great athlete like Alex only to lose it all right away again. So I think we're going to find out what kind of athlete You're, Jamie is now, aren't we? We are. And, and she has now dropped back into that portion of the field where Casey Monroe just came through. Uh, so she is now, you can see right in front of her, it looked like uh, Rhea Coble was passing her. That's how much of a gap that had formed about a minute, minute and a half. Uh, and Ashley Heller, I believe, also in the mix in that group. But we've got Jack back out on the course once again with an update. Jack, what do we got? Yep. So I'm looking up. It looks like Hawk Hall is first place. He's uh, power hiking really hard. I'm going to turn it around, get him on camera. Um, yes, this is Hawk Hall in the front. And I'll try to get you the rest of the people afterwards uh that might okay there there are a few guys within a minute of them i can't id it but that's hot call number one so Dave, again I we're looking at hot call up right in the now front. Woo. go for it this this is really important to grasp what these athletes are facing so at the bottom where bruce have failed is mile three and let's call it 3.1 5k into the race course they climb until five and a half and then descend down seven and they hit two obstacles so from mile 3.1 to probably six uh 7.1 they hit two obstacles and those obstacles are tyrolean traverse and hurdles tyrolean traverse could cause some issues if your hamstrings are starting to cramp but really this is just a four mile mountain run now so anyone who made it this far with legs gets to start going and anyone who's starting to struggle is going to be really, really exposed. When's the last time we saw a four mile mountain run in the middle of a race with really nothing to interrupt these people? Yeah, that's and a good point, Brack, and it's, it's gonna turn into a, a runner's course. And let's um let's talk about this. We got a great shot of hot call here, right? What do you what do you think David is going through his head? Because what I wonder is, all right, last year he went out hot, he built up a lead, and then he got gobbled up at the end. Now this year in these races up to this point in the in the uh, North American Series races, he's actually been a little humbled. He hasn't been on a podium yet, um, and I think he's been beaten every time he stepped out and towed the line. So I'm trying to wonder what this says about his confidence right now. Like, 
repeating his exact strategy of last year, if I were a betting man and I am, I would have bet that he would have went out more conservative today. And here, here we have him again, uh, leading the way. I don't know, Dave, what do you think about that? Well, I think a few things. First is that this is clearly the terrain that he is most confident on. When you look at the different race setups and formats and, uh, this is slightly less steep climbing than you'd have in a big bear where it's a little bit more power hikey. Um, but that he likes to run, not power hike anyways. Uh, if I'm that guy sitting in first position, you know, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. One is stay comfortable, stay comfortable, stay comfortable. But when you have three to four men within 60 seconds of you, you're also thinking, keep the pressure on. And so what he wants to do is try and get the, the type of lead where the men behind him stop chasing me and they start battling each other instead because they start concerning themselves with, well, can I at least hold second position? Listen, I raced his father for almost a decade. There yeah, is no, there is no cautious bone in the call family. They will hedge their bets aggressively. Huck call. If he is anything like his father and we've interviewed him i'd say he's a lot like his father he is brash he is egotistical and he is arrogant and i mean that in all three of those in a positive manner you need all of those to be a dominant killer endurance athlete he got beat on his home course last year and it spoiled his perfect debut People have been waiting for Hobie's son to come up for several years. And Hobie's, he's, he's pumped them up. He's talked about how good his kids are going to be. And Hawk lost after leading for like two hours. And he almost passed out on course. And there was nothing but ego that it brought him all the way through this past year back to this course. He has a lot to prove. He knows there's no tire, like we said earlier. And he is here to eradicate that memory from everyone. There is not going to be any cautiousness from him on course. He's out here to dominate today. Now, Bracken, I think you're spot on with his mentality, his mental game, and and, and how he approaches uh, this particular race. But it was also the Hercules hoist that gave him an issue on this course last year. And that's something that I just can't anticipate giving him problems again. As we're seeing uh, second male, that looked like Tyler Veerman coming up the climb. So... Uh, again, my point being, both of the things that gave him issues, which were both within the final quarter mile of that race, are not going to be issues this year to finish him off. He had a solid chance to win or come in second last year. I, I believe Atkins took him on the final big climb before descending, um, but he would not have lost to Ryland Shadeg were it not for those two back-to-back -back obstacles. Yeah, Perks, I'm going to rib Jack Bauer a little bit here. Perks of not uh, being able to stay with Hawk Call on a climb is that we get to see second and third uh, come by once uh, our, our friend Jack Bauer is faded. And I will say that I am impressed. Look at that gap that Tyler Veerman has on whoever is in third place right now. I didn't expect that. I figured he was going to run aggressive and then latch on to whoever's up front. Like Tyler Veerman's out climbing the Josiah Middows of the world, and we haven't seen Atkins yet. And here's Tyler like, now we're to the point in the race where he's asserted himself and he's actually building a gap on the guys behind him instead of fading. And that's promising. Speaking well, of promising, is, um... Ryan Atkins has not lost ground to Josiah. Oh, no, he has. That's Rylan. That is Rylan. I take that entire statement back. Rylan has been caught by Josiah. Josiah is demolishing this climb. And Jack Bauer is going to give us an update right now. All right, so I could split. I had a minute 15 on Tyler and Kirk. By the way, I stopped so I could get you guys, everyone else. I would have kept up with Hawk. But anyway, sure you did, uh, Jack. Sure Tyler you did. Was a minute 15 down. Josiah and Rylan were about 2:30. 2 2:30, and now we got Ryan Atkins. He's 3:10 down at the moment. So there's your top five. It's about 40 seconds. And there goes Atkins right did now. Josiah put on Atkins on one climb. But you have to think, Bracken. At Atkins could also take 40 seconds back on a descent, especially we have a couple mile, mile and a half long descents coming up in this race. Plenty of opportunity to, to close that gap, especially because this race is not an uphill finish. 
Oh, for sure. And that that doesn't disparage Atkins at all. That just highlights how freakish Josiah is as a master's athlete against these young bucks. It's just crazy the type of, of engine this man still has. And just like a fighter's power is the last thing to go, that uphill grinding is the last thing that Josiah is going to lose. He's got that all day long. Now, one name we distance, have not mentioned in the eight- Oh, it's it's eight fifteen in the morning there, and look at how that sun's beating on him already. I, I know that it's early, and I know the sun isn't as intense, yet, but look how exposed that mountain is. I just want to point that out. That even though it's early, and I did check the forecast, there's supposed to be like ten mile an hour winds, but you know how it gets when you get in those little dips and ski runs. There ain't no wind in there. That wind is blocked by the hills typically until you get up and crest up top. So I'm guessing these guys are already baking. Oh, they're hot. It's the sun hits really hard out here in Utah. It just does. And, and again, you saw how dry it was. Uh, There's, there's no moisture in the air to help cool you off a little bit. A lot of your sweat is just evaporating right off you. And uh, if you were curious, just how dry is it? Did you see the dust that was kicking up uh, in Hawk Call's wake as he was descending right there? And you can see Ryan Atkins again, hands on the knees, grinding up the hill, trying to minimize the damage. But Steve Hammond is ready to give us an update right now. Steve, what do you got for us? Uh, hey, David, uh, out here on the men's course, super steep descent that we just saw the call just go down now. Um, I just want to talk about a very pivotal point uh, in this course. Um, they're going to head down to Twister just now. I can't see second place male, but they're going to head down to Twister and then come back up. And this point in the course right here is where Ryan and Hawk had that little moment and that's where Ryan overtook. I don't think that's going to happen this year. Um, it's a little bit earlier on the course, but they've still got a very, very big climb all the way up to just below that ridge just up there. So I'm just here with the steep bit, which is kind of him having a race of his life right now, utilizing those downhills. He told me he was going to go for it this morning, balls to the wall. He's exactly doing that. Uh, amazing effort, and we're going to just see in a minute who's going to come down in third. Back to you guys. Very, very exciting out here. Thanks again, Steve. And as mentioned, that's Tyler Veerman sitting in second position. Hawk call, just so aggressive today. And then Josiah and... Uh, Ryland Shadeg battling for that third position with Atkins lurking in fifth. So there's your top five men, and I don't think it's that different than we expected to see at the lead pack. I mean, is there anyone that you're thinking, wow, they're really missing? Mark Batras has run really strong this year, but I wouldn't call this a Mark Batras course. I mean, we haven't seen VJ Jones yet, have we? So. Yeah, we have not. We're. We're. You know, we're what are we? Fifty minutes into this race, um, and we haven't mentioned his name yet, which is a little different, isn't it, fellas? But I think that the two people that we know typically manage their efforts well and close well. Uh, you know, we had a lot of shots of Ryan Atkins power hiking uphill. You know, he's not going to fade; he's only going to charge. So I actually really like Ryan Atkins' positioning. But VJ Jones now he's suddenly becoming a question mark. He is a late charger as well. So how much course is left? Plenty. Uh, but if those moves are going to start to be made by like a favorite like VJ, I feel like he's going to have to start reeling some of that line back in right now. What do you think, Bragan? Yeah, and, and we can't see how far behind he is. But what we are seeing right now is that downhills are going to matter more than hills today. The steeper the downhill is, the more it rewards skill over engine. And these are nasty, nasty descents, Kirk. And we see Ryland move past that camera and Tyler Veerman much differently than Josiah looked. Now, we don't want to go too far into visuals, but you can tell visually who's attacking a choppy technical descent and who is managing the descent. Josiah was managing. We know Ryland and Veerman are going to bomb it. We know that Hawk's going to bomb it. We know Atkins is going to send it. We know VJ is going to send it. Mark Botris, this isn't quite his send it terrain. So I think the downhillers are all going to meet up at some point on this course. And let's keep in mind, Hawk on our episode with him, Kirk, claimed that he is the fastest downhiller, that no one can run downhill faster than him. We're going to find out today if that's true or not. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, and there's the Ryan scary Atkins thing is out that... on the screen. 
Oh, go ahead, Jay. Take it, Kirk. Take it, Kirk. I Let's was going to say the scary, the scary thing is, uh, yeah, we got a little delay here, folks. So if you hear us talking over each other, technology, guys. Um, but I mean, the scary thing about that is, yeah, Hawk is a confident young man. Um, and if he says he is the best descender in sport, well, he also just led the first climb. So where where does that leave Chinks in his armor if if, his, if what he says is true? Like, if that thought, if that carries through, what's gonna, what's going to happen? What options does it leave everybody else? Well, you would say his weaknesses could be the heavy carries, and Steve Hammond's going to give us an update, and then we can get back into that, Steve. But I uh, just saw Tyler Beerman go past, he's completed Twitter. Now there is an amazing battle, you mentioned the battle of chess going on with uh, Josiah Reinenschadeg and Atkins just back in the picture just over there. They're all a tight group, they're going up this climb. Now this is pretty much, they've got a, uh, about a 1500 foot climb here all the way out through Peter and it doesn't end there like it did last year. It keeps going up. Um, it's about two or three hundred feet of uh, more than last uh, more than last year. They keep going up to the top and then from the top there's a very runnable, beautiful section of two or three miles. Uh, we see how that plays into uh, <laughs> into the hands of the runners on this course. But uh, I'm gonna quickly go off and see them up the top. Back to you guys. Thanks, Steve. And that's a great update. And I want to point out that that climb is the climb where last year we saw Ryan Atkins make his move on Hawk Call and pass him. It's got a riverbed that the course is winding in and out of as they ascended last year. I don't know if that's where they're going to send him on that particular climb. Um, but Ryland Chadeg also made his significant move passing Josh McAdams on that climb there as well. And McAdams, I have not seen today. I don't know if he's racing today. But he ran the entire race last year in a pair of New Balance RC Elite V1s, which is not a trail shoe. It's more of a carbon plated road shoe, but it has little teeth in it. And uh, his feet were basically falling apart by the end of the course of all the ascending last year. Uh, Bracken, what do you expect to happen over the course of this next climb and a little bit of rolling at the top? Well, here's the crazy thing. That's mile seven. So we're just over halfway through. Wait, this feels like we've lived an entire an race so far, and that is mile seven. So we are going to see all the cards on the table. This is the last big climb. If you have climbing in your legs, now is the time to use it. And Josiah, this is the farthest he's been into a mountain beast, still ahead of the descenders. Now, Ryland's right on his butt as is Atkins, but he started the climb ahead, and that is so huge mentally. You know, as I was saying about the women's race, about how I like those those three women, uh, Jamie, Rhea, and Rose working together, we saw we just have the exact same thing with Ryland, Josiah, and Atkins, and they all have sort of different strengths. Uh, you, could, you could relate Ryland to Atkins a little bit, um, but Josiah certainly maybe on the climbing end might be the best climber of those three. And now there's sort of a chance, right? There's sort of a chance for a group of guys to say, let's go get this young kid, Hawk Call. Like, let's let's do something now. I think that is so, VJ that we're seeing on screen right now. Not to interrupt you, Kirk, but but we're getting yeah. our first VJ sighting. And it looks like he is certainly not rushing in and out of that water station <laughs> right there. Taking his time. He's hurting. He's hurt. Have you he's, ever seen he's VJ walk on He's course. trying to basically. It's been a long time since I've witnessed that, and I would say it appears that he's not trying to win this race. He might just be trying to, you know, pick up a couple points here or there in case he needs them. But he may have reached the point in this race where he's decided uh, my fourth race that's going to matter is going to be the final race of the season. Well, let's speculate, guys. What do you think's going on there? I mean, I, I I don't have a clock on this, but we saw Hawk there at least five minutes ago, maybe up to seven minutes ago. Maybe more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is this uh, is this a uh, sort of a training race for him, or we just find it's, it might be an off day, or is this by design? What do you guys think? It, I, this, personally, I, I don't think that this is the most ideal course for VJ for a couple of reasons, and one being that the descents are a little more technical, and I think. 
uh, course like this that's mostly ascending and descending with a lot of brush and a lot of rocky terrain it takes away a little bit of the foot speed element and as one of the quicker runners in the race he doesn't get to utilize his best attributes and his best skills uh so i never looked at this as a race that i saw vj really looking at a top three position and uh he might be being realistic about this that the most important thing is don't get hurt in this race yeah Bracken, and your thoughts the thing about this course even though altitude in colorado helps here a ton as does being used to dry atmosphere this is not colorado terrain and vj is still evolving an athlete and last year he ran into problems at at ocr worlds and that he said it was a different terrain than i was training on a different incline and in a different terrain as someone who lived in colorado springs near vj i can attest that you cannot find this you can find switchbacks you can find scree you can find hard packed dirt you cannot find bushwhacking it it literally does not exist and so his engine just might not be translating to this. And when it doesn't translate and when you start to struggle, the heat hits you earlier because you're starting to crack. And we saw him at the water station showing that he's feeling the heat where the rest of the guys still seemed like they are managing the heat. That's exactly what I was talking about, Bracken, that this brush, it completely changes the dimension of this race. And it, it takes away VJ's biggest advantage, which is he really is one of the two or three quickest men in the field at any given race, but quickness isn't really gonna be a part of this event today. This is a grind up and technical descending. And uh, you know, you're know you seeing guys that, that like to be in that nasty stuff a little bit more. They're the ones who are truly excelling today. Yeah, the way VJ looked coming through that water stop uh, screams heat, doesn't it? If you saw, he took his hat off, filled <laughs> it up with water, put it back on his head. He drank a water cup, poured another one over himself. Um, it's just like, you know, we know it's coming, right? But but it's one thing to know it's coming. It's another thing to be out there on course actually doing it, right? But I will say about VJ, he did really, you know, he came from behind. And yes, he had a great swim in Mexico, which was the last uh, North American Series race, which, pro you know, propelled him to the lead. But um, he sort of entered that box where I was like, VJ will be great anywhere he goes, right? So I'm not going to count him out yet because VJ has proven to us enough times now that he is a player. He hasn't blown up or finished back in the pack uh, at all in the recent two years in any big race. So there's time. Now, I just received a text message update uh, saying VJ indicated uh, that he was feeling kind of sick before this race. And this is the first I've heard of it. And, and I don't have a secondary validation of that. But right now, Steve Hammond's on the course, and we got to get eyes on this. Steve. Hey, guys, Tyler Beardman has just passed me. A uh, whole call way out on the lead. He's even extended his lead. Um, up here, probably one of the most beautiful uh, beaters. Um, Josiah Middell, third place, only 10 seconds behind Beerman. A little bit of insight from uh, VJ, I was talking to him earlier. Um, he has been sick um, a couple of weeks ago. He was 50-50 whether he was going to race. He said he was going to go for it. Um, this kind of thing happens. See uh, Josiah and Ryland Shadeg battling it out uh, with uh, Atkins right behind. So I don't think we'll see VJ feature. I could be wrong. I hope I am wrong. Uh, we will see what happens later on in the race. But uh, they've still got a lot of climbing to go. They're going up there. Back to you guys. Thanks again, Steve. And uh, one thing that Steve pointed out right here was that the gap between Hawk Hall and the field was growing. And I'm not sure if that's entirely true, if it's between Hawk and the whole field, or if the gap between Hawk and Veerman just grew significantly because it looks like the field gained significantly on Veerman. Atkins, Shadeg, and Josiah now very close to Tyler Veerman. Man, watching Emma here charge up through the men's field, and she still is doing her wave at the camera, smile. She's the only athlete we've had on screen today, other than Ryan Atkins, who doesn't live above 6,000 feet. It just, it puts into perspective how truly great her ability is as an endurance athlete, that she can come to other people's playground, come do their strength and kind of just casually dominate them. I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the amount of exertion she's putting out, but she makes it look casual. 
that's something I have a a hard time. That's not. That's something I have a hard time wrapping my mind around, Bracken, is uh, we talk about this on our podcast, Running Public, a good bit, but we both live at sea level, Bracken, and I say going out to elevation to race a mountain race is like putting a governor on yourself, right? If my full potential mm-hmm. best day is 100%, I'm capped at like 85% best case scenario. Um, so it makes what, just piggybacking what you're saying, Bracken, like it makes what Emma does even more impressive because now a number of times she's gone to elevation and just completely split the field wide open. And there's no way we're getting her best self today. Not coming from lower elevation to higher elevation is physiologically impossible. Yet here she is leading by as much as she is. It it makes you wonder if she was living at elevation, how good would she be? Ugh, It's, it's, it's scary. It shows how good both the first place and the men and the women are. We have been focusing on this chase group because it's hard to keep up with the leader. So we are seeing that second through fourth battle on both sides, and you can see how they're playing off each other's strengths. They're trying to eat each other up on descents. They're looking at each other, marking each other on the climbs. They're making up gaps. They're always having something to chase after. And Hawk and Emma really just have themselves and their fitness out there, and they are destroying people. When your chase pack is losing ground and they're working hard, you're great. Now, Bracken, I don't want to uh, change the subject too much, but I would like the viewers at home to be aware of why we are having minimal coverage on the women's race right now. And it appears that one of our rabbits that was for the women's race uh, rolled an ankle on one of the descents on this really rugged, rocky, nasty terrain. And so that is why we only have minimal coverage of the women's race at this point. We'll be doing a little bit of shuffling to try and get a bit more coverage of that. But we are down a rabbit. And that goes to show you how dangerous and precarious the downhill running on this course is and how much skill it takes. Yeah, I mean, how privileged were we? Uh, unfortunately, it was our two-time world champ, Robert Killian, who rolled an ankle out there. Uh, it takes athletes like Robert Killian to keep up with these people out on course. So hopefully he's feeling all right. And uh, he's supposed to be racing tomorrow, but that might not be looking too likely now. Uh, yeah, I want to do a little uh, speculating on a topic, fellas. Now, we know Emma Cook-Clark is up front. We know Hot Call is up front. Other than our two race leaders, and Bracken, I'll kick it to you first. Whose positioning do you like the most to finish the race strong? Who would you like to be right now, both on the women's side and the men's side, other than the leaders, and why? I'll start with the men because I think the men are the only ones who have a chance to run the leader down. I think Emma is just the class of maybe both fields. Rylan and Ryan. Ryan Atkins has been here before and he's where he wants to be. But Rylan has that added boost of not having been here that many times. No one spent more time in these mountains than he has. No one has spent more time exposed to the sun at really high altitudes than Rylan. No one has. And yet this is only his second time being up in the mix for a lead at a big race. So he's got all the characteristics of everyone else, plus a lot more adrenaline coursing through his system than anyone else. So give me Rylan. On the women's side, I think I want the opposite. Give me Rose Wetzel. She's the old dog who's still showing new tricks. She's been here so many times, but she has yet to win a mountain race. She's done everything else but win a mountain race. And so even though she's been here a million times before, this one feels a little different to me. You know, it's so funny you say this, Bracken, because those were my two picks as well for uh, athletes that I like how they looked the last time we saw them on screen. And for uh, a number of reasons, I look at the motivation factor as well. I, it's not that I don't think Ryan Atkins is motivated because he is, but you know, I think when you've gone a while without really getting that big podium finish or that big win that you've been seeking. It, it's got that extra fire in the belly. Um, and, you know, for, for Ryland, I think he's he's been chomping at the bit, like waiting for his opportunity. And this is a, a really prime one. But I want to talk about Rose specifically because you're looking at an athlete who was at the top, the absolute pinnacle of the women's sport for a period of about a year and a half maybe two years, was Rose Wetzel and Amelia Boone back and forth for a few years in the 2014, 2015, maybe even early 2016. 
And there was a period where on certain courses, Rose was unbeatable. And all of a sudden, you saw the, the women's field get a bit deeper. You saw the emergence of a Lindsey Webster. You saw Nicole Merkel. You saw Faye Stenning come in. And all of a sudden, Rose was pushed down the pecking order, followed by having a child, um, some other personal life issues with health, with family. And in the last year or so, she's talked a lot about how she's really gotten back into what has made her made her the athlete that she was that was so great and she's finally feeling the confidence and fitness and i think you combine that with the the opportunity that's in front of her right now rose wetzel is primed to have a huge second place finish today if she can hold it all together well i'm gonna i'm gonna piggyback then i'm gonna let us speculate some more because i like speculating guys so when we get eyes back on this women's race other than seeing emma just crush up front Who's going to be in second? Who's going to be in third? And who's going to be in fourth? Take your shots, Bracken. Who do you think? I think we see Rose. I do. And I think that we've seen Alex Walker move up. That that would be my, my guess. I would say Rose and Alex are going to be two and three. I'm going to go with Rose in the second position. Rhea is still in third, but Walker has now moved up to fourth. And and forgive me for this because I did not get eyes on the start line ahead of time. Uh, but is Annie Duby present in this race or no? Nope. Well, that, that does shake things up because obviously she would have been one of my, my big picks. On the men's side... I have a hard time counting out Ryan Atkins. Like I could easily see him somehow stealing this entire race just because he does what he does. Um, but my question is, is can Josiah hold him off on the descent in that, that two, three position? I'm not sure if, that if, he can. If Josiah could hear a commentary now, which he can't live, you know, we just, we just gave him a disservice saying we like Ryan Atkins and Rylan Shattig too bad. He can't keep that receipt and use it as fuel during the race but he's he's very tenured and so you know we'll see if he uh, keeps it clean on the back half of the course we got jack bauer up here with a little update for us because it looks like rose wetzel still in second position and right behind her Rhea coble so i feel good about David, my picture you nailed here, guys. It, it was just how they that looked it, you know They're both going to picking it, their way Let's down that descent. You're both breaking. And this is this is the only thing that's going to leave the door open for other women. It's really too bad Jamie ran into wall issues early because she would throw some spice into this battle here. Both of those women were breaking down it. Now, we don't know. Rose looks like she's hobbling. Rose has a yes. hitch in her giddy up. She is not running smooth. I don't know if it's quad damage from the descents or if she rolled something, but she is not herself anymore. And we know Rhea is not going to fade. So if there's a descender behind these two, the door is still open. To me, that looked like an ankle bracket. I'm not sure what your thoughts were, but that looked like the stride of someone who was having tenderness in one of her ankles. And maybe that's something that Rose will be able to shake off, but there's a clear limp going on there. It's the I last think that's thing gonna... you want with two and a half miles of descending to the finish. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's something that work itself out when she starts, when she has the opportunity to climb again, but she really needs to use those as we see right here. She kind of, you know, less impact. She's able to kind of use her mechanics the way she would like, but yeah, exactly right. I think she's going to hold tight, tough on this ascent, but when she has to descend again, it's, it's going to be a tough deal. I will say now, I don't know how long ago, maybe Rose, uh, hurt herself slightly there, but I'm very impressed with Rhea Coble being in the mix. Um, even following some of that descending and all that, that looks very promising for Rhea. And we do have sort of a long, gradual, grindy climb uh, on the back half of this course before they do their final descent. And that's a lot of room for Rhea to get to work, uh, maybe even get a little bit of a cushion if she can. So like right now, it looks really promising for Rhea considering the circumstances. It does. And this so is, this in the is race, Rose. Uh, er Dave, before you, before you finish off, I, I do want to highlight Rose. Of one, 
other than maybe chopping descents, one of the only things she struggled with historically is getting into and onto obstacles. She lands and takes off explosively right away. Even with that ankle, she's up moving, but she does tend to dawdle beforehand. Rhea got three quarters of the way across the twister before Rose even touched the obstacle. And right now we'll you've got that, eyes folks. on the fourth place female and it's Chris Roglowski back in it. She worked her way back up and that's a name none of us thought we'd see up at the front again. And if you're Chris Roglowski, you're about 30 seconds behind Rose Wetzel and you're seeing her limping. I think you you smell blood in the water. I think Chris realized she now. got out way she too takes hot. Second. Yeah. I, I was dang it, Bracken, we think alike, don't we? <laughs> Uh, she realized she got <laughs> she looks she, the best right now no it's it, it's fantastic it's no I, we, we we're in sync here but uh I, I would just say like um she realized she went out too hot she realized she you know we know her mindset now and it's i'm gonna go out there and win i'm gonna go out there and beat emma and she realized that was a fool's dream about five minutes into this race and i think she consciously backed the throttle <laughs> off uh allowed herself to manage her effort uh and maybe is even racing a little more tenured than she is and now she's going to make her push on that that second climb that's what i think is going to happen i think i think we did get nervous for her but i think maybe she deserves a little more credit with knowing her body than we think don't you fellas we've got jack out here jack wants to give an update jack let's hear it yeah so chris moved her way back into fourth place it looked like she got dropped early so she's charging hard you're definitely right Rose has a little bit of a limp, um, looked like maybe her left ankle. I didn't ask her, but she's she's hobbling a little. Rhea, um, they're, they're about two seconds separated right now. This is the point where Ryan Atkins last year passed Hawk Call to make his move into first place on that steep kind of stream section right here. They're going to be going through some rock. Um, I'm going to try to, I think that's Jamie maybe in fifth. So I'm going to go back and uh, get a status on that. But top four, Emma's clear of, of them by several minutes um but it's a good two to four battle right now thanks jack and uh you know if we, if we were to go and, and talk about how each of these athletes looked obviously we know that emma cook clark looks phenomenal right now but if you're looking at Rhea Kobel and rose wetzel obviously ray is going to look more comfortable on the climb and the descent because of the ankle with rose but i think she's just always comfortable going uphill she to me, she's an athlete that has only like two gears. She like kind of gets the second gear and then she just kind of maintains it for the rest of the race. Uh, Rose has a couple extra gears, but she has to sit in that first gear on the climb comparatively. I think Chris Roglowski looks like she is primed to move into that top two position if she can manage to sustain on this next climb because she's clearly descending well. I agree with you on that. And Rhea is a compact athlete. She doesn't have the long limbs that some of the others have, and that lends itself to her stride never changes. She looks the same when she's hurting mm -hmm. and to when she's feeling good. And normally, I would say she gets to the top of this mountain well clear, and she's now in the driver's seat. But this is the one climb that it is not super efficient to run. It's that creek bed. There's a lot of flat steps rather than angled steps. Power hiking is going to be necessary at times, and she spends less time power hiking than anyone else. Chris has been up running 14ers, power hiking a lot through boulder fields. This will actually be maybe the only climb on course where she could on paper have an advantage over Rhea. And I want to interrupt you for a moment, Bracken, just because what we saw is Jamie Brusa and then Alex Walker. And if Brusa did complete that obstacle safely, the Twister, uh, then there's a battle brewing right here for the fifth and final position. Um, and, you know, we're talking about big money differences between these positions when we go first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And um, between fifth and sixth, you know, for an event, you're only talking about $100 difference or fourth and fifth. It's $100 difference. But when we're talking about that, that one, two, three, you're talking about $2,000 for second place, 1000 for third and 800 for fourth. So those places really matter. Alex Walker isn't really known to fade, uh, not from my recent memory. And she's also somebody that I would say takes care of business out on the race course, meaning she's not going to make any glaringly obvious mistakes. She's not going to offshoot or miscalculate her effort in any major way. 
So I actually, and you can see this gap closing even a little bit there between Alex and Jamie. Um, I like her positioning to continue moving up. I think Alex is, you know, she's to that phase in the race where she smells blood in the water. And I think, um, as you can see, she's even making up more ground here, but, um, I just don't see her fading. This will, she will not finish worse than fifth place without question in my mind right now. And then on that flip side, we were talking about Rhea Coble and, you know, Rhea is historically not known as like a fantastic descender. At least that's our perspective perception, but have we ever seen Rhea in a close battle recently late in a race? I think that maybe we have an opportunity to see Rhea Coble maybe unlock another door to her descending if she's battling it out. In my opinion, this late in a race, there's a reason to run more aggressive. It's not her body that's not capable. It's sometimes, you know, your mind that slows you down going downhill. If I'm going to battle for second place, it's the, I'm going full send and I'm going to take some risks. It's definitely the mental game with Rhea Coble. And, and when she debuted in this sport, and I want to say it was 2016 when we first started seeing her emerge, she was relatively unbeatable for about a three-race period. I believe it started with the Monterey race that year. And she came in out of nowhere crushed everyone and we said wow this is a new major contender in the field and then within a few races we realized uh she's not as dominant a force as we expected it to be and i think i agree with you entirely that this is a lot of that is mental with her and that when she's mentally locked in she could be so tough to beat but she doesn't love to attack uh she's more of a hold her pace and wear everybody else down kind of racer I agree with you guys. Now, we mentioned a couple times that maybe she and Rose don't love descending because it's too technical and they prefer to break. And we mentioned that we picked people over Josiah, even though he's sitting in the driver's seat right now. And I kind of want to expand on why, because it sounds like maybe we're just being disrespectful to an athlete or two. And I would say that if the course ended at the bottom of the last descent, my money might be on Josiah but we have the last about a thousand meters with something like eight or 10 obstacles. And we know that from the moment mm. they touch that to the end of it, he will not be better at any one of those obstacles or the transitions on and off than Ryland, then Ryan, and then Tyler. And so if it still was just an engine competition, he would be one of the favorites, but he will do nothing but lose on the last set of obstacles time. And Rose will do nothing but lose on that last descent if her ankle continues to betray her. So if things play according to a script here, Chris Roglowski is going to arrive at the bottom of the mountain in first. And there's a real good chance Alex Walker passes both on the descents unless Rose figures out her ankle and Rhea decides to, like Kirk said, I'm in a battle, we're going full send. How does one figure out their Another ankle in race is... bracken? <laughs> Sometimes those things numb up for a little bit. Sometimes in the middle of a workout mm -hmm. or in the middle of a race, it's really bad when it first happens, and it almost just like toes the line after a while. Like, you're not going to arrest me. We're really going to keep doing this. All right. In the moment she takes her shoe off after the race, it's game over. But there is a chance that it no, yeah, numbs she won't be walking up tomorrow. and just... No, but there's a chance she can get through that final descent. But if it doesn't, you're going to take her tentative descending and add an ankle to it. She might get passed by two or three women on the last descent. And I want to point out some of the the long term uh, implications that this race has in the positioning that we currently have. Uh, let's talk about the men's field just because uh, when we look at the, the total point standings right now, you have uh, VJ in first and Atkins in second. So clearly an opportunity for Atkins to leap up the leaderboard, uh, possibly catch VJ depending on, on how things go. Uh, Shadeg currently sits in fourth position behind Mark Batras. So he is about 80 points behind Mark Batras. And then you have Nick Matz and not, you no, know, there's a gap with Mark Gaudet, Logan Broadbent, Lars Arneson, and it's not until 10th that you see Hawk call. So Hawk with a opportunity to dramatically move up. And a lot of this is because of the races that they ran at. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shadeg finished, has never finished no worse than eighth in any race this year. He was sixth in San Luis Obispo. He was fifth in Big Bear. And then he was eighth 
in Puebla, in Mexico. And so he is looking to establish, you know, he's going to be top eight in four consecutive races, puts him in a really strong position. But Hawk Call with a win today, because we know how much, how many, 300 point win is so dramatic. Uh, how do you guys think that this impacts the, the, the season? Well, you have to think, you know, Hawk is, is I believe, the only one on the top 10 uh, list who's only raced twice. So that also goes to show how well, has that, is that correct, fellas? Has he only raced twice, I believe? Or does he have three races under his belt? He, has a, he has a ninth place finish at Big Bear. He was fourth at San Luis Obispo. And I don't believe he raced at Puebla. At least if he did, I don't have results right. for him in front of me. Right. So, so on paper, it looks a little worse for Hawk than it actually is. So getting a, a third race, we won't actually know how this all shakes out for him until the very fifth race of the season. But he's only going to move up after today. Yeah, you're, you're correct on that. And what it does yeah, well, we're is gonna it We're going to take a look at the hard. leaderboard here so that we can talk this out for a moment. Because Hawk Cole has 372 points, which if you add 300 to it, theoretically, he's at 672 now, he'll still be a race short of some of these guys. So on the virtual lead, he won't be quite there. But uh, Or in the virtual lead, he'll be right up there. But in the actual leaderboard, he'll still be a race short. He may be behind some of these guys. But it's an opportunity for him to then, you know, get anywhere in the top 10 and put himself in a top three, four position overall for the series. One win can do that for you. Now, speaking of uh, of all of these gentlemen, as we as we looked at that list there before, now who are we not talking about that's not on that list? Like who are and Brack and I know you got some good intel on this. If Jack Bauer could chime in, if he'd have some great intel on this, but um, who are these outside guys that that might creep? Let's talk like fifth through tenth, right? Who are we looking at that might be able to sneak in there that we haven't heard of or that we haven't talked about yet? What do you think, Brack? I'm almost more disappointed by the guys who aren't here, who aren't giving themselves a chance to sneak in. Like, I would love to see Lars Arneson on this course. And I know that's not even the question you asked me, but as a fan, as someone who's sitting here like on pins and needles, waiting to see our next shot as we finally see uh, Hawk Call come into to frame here, who looks much better physically than he did at this point last year. Lars Arneson, not here today. Uh, on the female side, not seeing a Lindsay, people that had their chance to make a move in the series and aren't going to be able to. Annie Doobie. See how bouncy Hawk looks there? That's scary. Yeah. Look at that stride. It's just a thing of beauty. This is a spot right here. If you are borderline cramping, these are the type of obstacles that even though they're not really failable obstacles to the top end, if you've got a twinge, it becomes a cramp on something like this. If you don't have a twinge, you might develop one. I'm interested to see how he jumps off this thing, how he lands. Well, wrong direction, but it didn't look smooth. like he had to grab anything on his leg. So can we get an update? Hey, this is an so opportunity for Hawk Call. Any the camera, if any of the camera guys can give us a, a mileage indicator, but I'd like to know where we're at on course right now, unless you fellas can dissect the map there. They just went over. Yeah, I can grab uh, that. What was it? Yeah, that'd be great. That was that was the stairway. And to I think Steve Hammond can go too. Yeah, that was stairway to Sparta. That's obstacle 22. And So that's at mile. They're coming looks up. Like that's at mile 10. Okay. 10 and three quarter. No, excuse Let's me. Let's go to Jack if you don't mind. You guys want an update real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we're let's get an about update, Jack. Ten. Hawk came through. Um, Hawk came in in first. We're about mile mile ten at the barbed wire. Uh, Hawk came in in first. Tyler in second. Not too far behind him was Ryan uh, uh, Ryan Atkins in third. Josiah fourth. I some guy with longer hair. I I didn't get his name in fifth. And then Ryan in sixth. Two through six is probably separated by thirty seconds. Going into the descent, there's no more climbing really after this point. So whoever gets first to the bottom, that's going to make a big difference. So we have a dark horse in the mist right now. And again, uh, Hawk Call really trying to hold on to this thing as he's beginning the descent. And Steve Hammond has additional updates out in the course. Steve, take it away. 
Hey guys, uh, I couldn't quite hear what Jack was saying if you went live to him, but uh, Hawkeye has a two minute and 40 second lead. He has the lead on um, the chest pack, which is Tyler Veerman, and there's about 20 seconds between Tyler in second, uh, Ryan Atkins in third, and Josiah Medell, and just behind that is Ryland Shadeg. So here comes Tyler right now. Uh, he is about 250, so Hawk is, <laughs> Hawk actually could put another 10 seconds on. He's tied him and coming here. He's got a little bit of time on. Let me just. Uh, stairway to Sparta, making that look easy. Now, we are my 10 and a half here, guys. It is all the way downhill. This is it. This is where you want to absolutely go for it. We have. Tyler, Ryan Atkins, here we go, and there's super gnarly descent down there, um, and off they go. Horse about 250 ahead now, um, as Ryan comes up. Um, so tired, grabbing his side a little bit as well. Amazing stuff. Guys, back to you. Take it away. Well, uh, quick to point out a couple things. One, Hawk Call extending that lead. Uh, truly incredible running effort from him today. And I think the, the day that Hawk Call has officially arrived is today. And, and second, that's Josiah starting to labor a little bit in the back there. And, and I think we called it. We knew this was coming, but, you know, can he hold himself together? He's a savvy veteran. I think um... – I think maybe the mystery gentleman, and this is via Jack Bauer's intel, there's a potential it's a gentleman named Travis Fuller. He's supposed to have some longer hair with a good mountain running credential. There's a chance that our mystery gentleman up front could be him. Um, and then I wanted to ask about the elephant in the room, guys. The Oh, looks like Steve wants to chime in. Steve? Uh, yeah, just to chime in on that, uh, that's a guy called Rick, he's actually running the Ultra, uh, he's not part of the elite crew here, he just thought it would be fun to run with the elite guys for a little bit, as Ryland Shadeg just goes on there, that's your top five guys, um, and quite a significant gap, um, no VJ in sight, um, back to you guys, we've got to go and chase him, see you in a bit. Kirk, pick it up again Well, negate what I just said then. Yeah, um. Yeah, negate what I just said there. I thought I was being smart, but I guess I was wrong. It's, um, well, I want to talk about the one the one little elephant in the room we haven't chatted about quite yet. Uh, Hawk Call's looking good. This is looking really good for him. In fact, he may be building up enough of a cushion here uh, to even make a mistake in the gauntlet down low, but we got to talk about the Hercoist, fellas. We can't not talk about the Hercoist. Is this spell impending doom for Hawk, or is this thing, eh, thing of the past? He might have too big of a lead. Doesn't even matter right now. This, uh, this has a, a feeling of a question that you might have thrown out on an episode of Undisputed right now, because obviously we are, <laughs> we are um, expecting him to have no trouble uh, with this obstacle this year. I think that one of the reasons he struggled with it was he really was blowing up, and then he had the tire flip where he sent everything he had. And then there was nothing left for the hoist. I don't think he's going to run into the same issues this year. What do you think, Bracken? May have lost Bracken for a minute. Now, one thing of note, one thing of note, uh, with Hawk Call in the lead there, it looked like Ryan Atkins and Tyler Veerman are still your 2-3 your at this moment. So Veerman has managed to hold his position, at least a podium at this point. And it's Shadeg who was actually sitting in fifth, coming over the stairway to Sparta. So maybe not working out exactly how we anticipated there, Kirk. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we historically, again, in the brief history, we've known Ryland Shadeg or Shadeg, um, He's been a closer and he's been a descender, right? Um, so all we've historically seen him do is pound home in these mountain races late. Um, the, the problem here is he's surrounded by other fellas who are great at pounding home late in races. So it may just take away from that glow that he typically has compared to whoever he's been around in past races on that final descent. However, um, 
what is the time gap there, right? Are we talking 20, 30 seconds at most between those fellas, which means all that could flip flop a number of times still. So um, I, I think just looking at Tyler Veerman here, um, obviously he's not bluffing. Obviously he's not going to blow up bad enough to go through, you know, start walking backwards through the field. He's kind of at that point right now where he's committed. He is very committed. And all of those guys have been looking at Tyler Veerman's back for the last how long hour. So Tyler's in a sense doing a little bit of the work here. So the guys behind him have somebody to kind of focus on and chase, look at his back, stay really engaged. And Tyler's just running blind up front, even though he's only 20 seconds ahead, you know, he's got to keep the pedal down where the other fellas got, got their eye on a prize. And that's Tyler right now, which might play to their advantage on this last ascent. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I've watched Tyler run a lot. I've run with him. Uh, he looks like his normal Tyler Veerman stride. There's no hitch in it. There's no limp. There's no, uh, you know, shortening up of that stride, any fatigue levels. No, no worrying about his ankles right now. He's descending really well. He looks smooth. And I'm not sure that this descent is going to be where people pull him back. Now, if it's close... In the final few obstacles, it's possible that Atkins could make a move. But uh, at this point in time, Veerman looks great. You know, I like to think of Tyler Veerman and myself, very similar runners on flat terrain. Um, very similar runners on flat terrain, not at elevation. We had a chance to race each other in Florida earlier this year. And then again at San Luis Obispo. And Tyler and I were shoulder to shoulder in all three races, give or take three to five seconds halfway through the race. Now we both made a mistake in San Luis Obispo, missed our spears and then fell through the pack. And then in Florida, he ended up winning both races due to his fitness being great and uh, and some costly mistakes by myself and others. But the point I'm getting at here is you're going to see Tyler at his worst on flat terrain at sea level. Where you're going to see Tyler at his best is in the mountains at elevation. He lives at elevation. He trains in the mountains. That's his strong suit. And if he can go out and win races that are flat at sea level, what can he do on a course that actually suits him? And we're finally seeing that today. And I really like that. Bracken, we haven't heard from you in a while. What are your thoughts right now as the men are moving into the final section of this course? We might still be missing some audio from Bracken. Uh, yeah. In are we meantime, are we connected now? There he is. No, the, so you're the back. professional there he is. back in there might have might have muted himself on accident there. Never, never. Now I was never. unable to see the coverage for a little bit here. So have we had some updated in placement or, or or position that I that I was unable to see? Right now we're looking at uh, Hawk Collin first, Beerman in second, Atkins third, Josiah fourth, Shadeg just behind Josiah in fifth. That was at Stairway to Sparta. And then since then, we've seen a good, solid descent out of Beerman. Well, this is going to be Tyler's chance. And you may have talked about this already, but we all get to this point in a race where we think, if I f miss out on a podium, it's because of this right here. And it's this moment. It's can he keep it pegged all the way down with two monster descenders on his back? Yeah, and he is descending no. very well. Like, I would say that is not something I'm particularly concerned about with him because his descending has been strong all day. I would say the bigger concern is we still have a spear throw looming, and it's the first time anybody has mentioned the word spear throw, and we know how much this has shaken up a race like it did in the last race in Mexico where Ryan Atkins had his spear go in and out and took a penalty and ended up finishing fourth. <laughs> Speargate. I was going to touch on the uh, the descending piece um, real quick. Um, you know, as an athlete, uh, most of us, and myself included, go back and dissect segments on the course after it's all done. And you can find out, oh, how did I line up against the others on the descent, let's say. And combing through past data of races in which I've been in, Tyler's been in, Atkins, VJ, everybody, you see like a, a host of guys like um, a Johnny Luna Lima before we have Ryan Atkins, VJ Jones, and like a Ryan Kempson who's not here today. And they all typically descend on the front end of the field, but only even in like a 20 to 25 minute descent, you have a guy like Tyler Veerman, only like 30 seconds back typically. So is he the best descender of all of them historically? No, 
Oh, is he almost? Yes. So he's not far off by so, uh, his, by, by old data standards. Kirk, I just want to point out that this is a sandbag carry for Tyler Veerman, and he looked across for a moment right there, took breath to see what looked like Hawk Call coming down the backside of that carry. Now, I could be mistaken, and we'll know when he reaches the top exactly what we're looking at, but Hawk Call is already off and running, and Tyler Veerman is still on the sandbag carry. So whether that race is still up for grass for first place, unclear, but it looks like Hawk Call has a very – commanding lead still as he's working his way towards the base of that mountain. So this is the last obstacle that Sam Big carry before the real gauntlet starts. So Tyler is not halfway through the carry yet. Hawk is off the monkey bars and the monkey bars signal the beginning of the gauntlet. You run a little bit from monkey bar to the next, run a little bit from monkey bar to what would that be? Bucket carry and then Z wall. And then from then on it's gauntlet time. So we are about to see. Well, here's is Hawk going to have any issue at all? Now, uh, Veerman is descending right now. We don't know how far he is from the monkey bars, but let's say that it's been about 40 seconds so far. He was 250 behind at the start of the descent after Stairway to Sparta. And ha we have Steve Hammond right now at the bucket carry. Steve, you got an update for us. I do, I do, I do indeed. Hi guys. Um, Hawk Call is down the mountain. He accelerated down this. He's descended so incredibly well. And Hawk Call is on the bucket carry just behind me. Here is his dad. Super, super excited at the fact that uh, his hobby, that his son has got a two, almost a three minute lead. Uh, Tyler Verman has just finished sandbags and uh, we can't see him in sight just yet. Is he home and dry? <laughs> no. There is Herkoist, uh, there is a, a difficult multi-rig, and there is a spear throw. Um, there's about a mile left, as I can see him coming down here. Super proud dad, super awesome son. Here we go. Well, thanks again, Steve. And again, that is the end of the bucket carry for Hawk Call. We were asking, you know, what are the, you said, Kirk, what are the chinks in his armor? What are the, what are the weaknesses potentially? And we said maybe heavy carries, but he's through those with still a very commanding lead, working his way into the final obstacle gauntlet. And again, this may just come down to, is he going to have any issues with spear throw as now? Okay, that's a time gap. We're looking at probably close to three minutes. Tyler Veerman, if that was him. Uh, coming out of the monkey bar. So that was Veerman. So, so again, with such a huge lead, he just has to make no mistakes right now. As you can see, that Hawk Call is in and out of Z-Wall with no problems. And Atkins is hunting now. He's hunting Veerman. He's within about 30 seconds of Veerman. You just do not want this. Yeah, Hammond. You do not want that man on you towards the end of a race because I don't know if anyone closes out a race harder than Ryan Atkins. No one's faster through those monkey bars. No one's going to be faster through the Atlas Stone here. No one's going to be faster through the Herc Hoist. He is just going to be the fastest in and out of everything from here on out. Yeah, yeah, but and, let's, uh, and let's talk again, about with his Mr. Tyler Veerman the last time he was in Utah. T Tyler uh, pounded home the last time he raced this venue uh, to take his first podium position, take a third place. He was in a tight battle, and Veerman closed harder than anybody in his surroundings. So it's not to – I mean, Ryan Atkins has proven his closing ability time and time again, but I will say we haven't been able to have tight eyes on Veerman in a situation like this. And Veerman's not weak. Veerman's going to dig into this thing, right? And he does close well. So, so I think we have a worthwhile battle on our hands. It's not submiss let's not submit quite yet, but um, Tyler's going to have to find another gear, I think. And Josiah 100%. Middow, still in fourth position. I have not seen Ryland Shadag in a little while. And the question is, has he been able to break away enough, or is Ryland going to be right on him when this camera pans over? Come on, Ryland. There's Ryland. 
So you're looking at what, maybe 20 seconds between them, and with obstacles still in the way, uh, I I would say I would not count Rylan out of that fourth position quite yet. But this is the story of the day right here. This is Hawk Call making his move in towards the finish. Yeah, my biggest surprise is um, is Rylan um, actually. I would say in loose quotes, fading back just a little bit. Uh, into fifth position, given uh, he's closed really well in the past. I think it's just a testament to how well everybody else is running up front as well. And as much as I would like to see the rest of this race, what I really want to keep eyes on is Hawk Call right now, because we have two significant obstacles at the front. One is going to be the Herc Hoist, and the other is the Spear Throw, and he's coming onto them right now. These are, for him, the two scariest remaining tasks. And I'd like to stay on Hawk Call yeah. if possible. This is this is the interesting part here because I I went back and rewatched oh, last going year's easy. Utah race, and Hawk's body language and his stride were really really good until they weren't. Even coming off the spear throw, mm -hmm. he hammered off the spear throw, and then suddenly the tire just knocked him dead. So if he gets these last two pulls here, there's really nothing else left here, because he looked so good until well, it looks he looks like he had no problem. He's still looking good. No, there's nothing left now. Well, Hawk Call has definitely throw. got it as he's headed towards the spear throw. And he has a And we'll be lead. sure to, ta to toggle back over. At this point, it's going to take... Uh, it's even with a missed spear here for Hawk, which is coming up, that's going to be the biggest question mark. Hawk's going to have to lose this race now. He's going to have to try very hard to lose this race. Um, not that anything's oh, ever locked absolutely. up because this is obstacle course racing, but, um, man, he's worked really hard to get this gap to afford him the luxury of even a Miss Spear. And, and that's a powerful so thing. The story of this men's race is who's going to be second, who's going to be fifth, because right now you have four men where really anyone theoretically could still finish in second position, but it really looks like a two-man race for second and a two-man race for fourth. And you're looking at a dive Look at from thing. Atkins to move within just a couple seconds of Veerman. And if you're Tyler Veerman, you are very be... scared right now as he's going over the A-frame. You have Cargo, Hercoy, Spear Throw, Rolling Mud, Dunk Wall, Helix, Slip Wall. There are a lot of transitional opportunities here. And these are probably the two best at the front of the pack at doing it. So I think it comes down to Herkhois. That's the only differentiating factor here. And then Spear Throw is probably the longest obstacle or the shortest, depending on how you attack it. There, there could be a 10 second difference in how people throw their spear. And I can't wait to watch the technique on the hoist and on the spear. Well, Hawk Call is already through Helix, which means that He's here right at the end. It's spear throw now for Hawk Call as you've got two men battling on her coist. But this is the race for the win right now. What Hawk Call needs is to nail this spear throw. He gets this. He's going to claim his first victory in a, an Elite Series race. And this is a massive performance on his home course. Ryan Atkins and now right has now, a really looks like Ryan second gap. Yeah, Atkins having gap Veerman. That's a stick from Hawk Call, and you're looking at the new winner, the new Utah champion, Hawk Call, taking this thing home to the finish line right now, just a slip wall between him and victory. Ryan Atkins moved past on that hoist and sprinted out of there. Tyler Veerman jogged out of it and stopped for water. Now, with 800 meters remaining in this course, if you're stopping for water, it's because you absolutely have to stop for water. <laughs> That's true. And what you're seeing right now is Hawk Call diving into the rolling mud. Just a couple more ascents for him and the slip wall in front. And this is the first victory of Hawk Call's career in a North American Elite Series race. The first of what we assume will be many. Taking after his father, he made that debut last year with his third place finish. And we said to ourselves, you know, we have a new star emerging. Right now, the question is, you know, how good is this kid going to be? I'd like yeah, to have a Hawk cam and a Hobie cam right now. 
because I have a feeling oh, yes. we'd be getting some entertainment out of his father at this moment. Yeah, Hobie is the ultimate hype man, and Hawk gets his defining moment right here. He gets his opportunity to finally say, I'm living up to my hype. And we've got Hawk call back on screen. So he's got a little running stretch still to go to get to that finish line. And this is a big moment in the race because this is – we've got Atkins and Veerman throwing spears. And Stuck. Atkins didn't make that same mistake this time. Atkins has nailed the spear. But what we need the is an update on mistake of Veerman. having the target betray you. <laughs> I mean, Atkins has had many bad breaks with the spear throw before. But now, Tyler missed his man, spear right here. Hall call. Expo, so I'd be curious to see if he does it as well. Just because, um, you know, once you miss a spear throw, it can get in your head a little bit. And I'd love to see, you know, Tyler holding on there if he can, but that spear's in his way. So I'll be curious how that panned out. Atkins doesn't look in any particular rush. Second place for him would be a phenomenal effort today. Help him move up that looter board significantly. It's really, really early here to make any dramatic statements because we haven't yet heard from the other athletes how they feel they performed. But now Hawk is hurting here. But if he finishes with a three-minute gap, this immediately goes down as one of the more impressive and dominant male victories we've seen at the national series level. We've seen a lot of women put Particularly up. Particularly. We a... see two women put, put up massive gaps. But we haven't seen a big, big, big dominant win like this in probably a year or so. Well, this man led wire to wire, and he's going to take it across the fish line as your Utah champion on the day. Hawk Call is no longer just the son of Hobie Call. Hawk Call is a champion of a North American Elite Series race. Today's win goes to Hawk Call in dominant wire to wire fashion. And that's a proud papa right there. Congrats to that young man, huh? It, it's something we knew could happen. It really is. But to actually see it happen feels a little different now that I just watched it. It seems like a bigger exclamation point than I thought it would. What, how does it feel to you guys? I didn't expect him to be so dominant the entire race. You just assumed at some point one of the other contenders would drag themselves into it and make it a bit of a dogfight. But... He ran, he ran that race the way Hobie Call used to run races, which is flawlessly front running, just breaking the entire field. Everyone else was racing for second the entire day. Well done. Very well done. And here's second place right now. Somebody, the last time we saw somebody lead that first big climb and actually hold on to the win, I can't even tell you, maybe one of Robert Killian's world championships back in 2016. In one of these big races, we don't see traditionally the person who has led that first climb hold on through the finish line. And we just watched it, almost like history in a sense, because with such an aggressive field, you rarely see that. So going wire to wire is very, very impressive because history proves that typically doesn't happen. Now, I would like and, to point out as Ryan Atkins question. runs in here for second place, not a huge gap, by the way. Not a massive gap between them the way we expected it to be. The three minutes shrunk significantly. It really did. But go on, when Bracken. Ryan's hunting, time goes out the window with the leader when Ryan's hunting. He had such a, a group of prey in sight that he was just in all-out attack mode. But we expected Hawk to be able to lead and to be able to win. But would he fade towards the end? What I don't think anyone here expected was he would pull away towards the end. From mile 7 to 12, he put an extra minute on the field. And that, like you said, Kirk, is kind of yes. shocking. Mm -hmm. It is. And like Tyler Veerman here is going to end up wrapping up a third place finish today. And, and very similar to a lot of other Veerman races where he goes out hard and he sputters a little at the end. But this time the man held it together in third place is... It's an amazing performance considering the field and the length of this race. 
My guess is Tyler Veerman ran one of the most painful races out of all the racers out there. <laughs> going on, basically looking at no, he wasn't leading, right? And Hawk has that mojo going from leading. And then you have Tyler Veerman, who knows he's in second, looking at nobody the entire race with all that anxiety of guys behind you, only to get past in the last little bit. I bet you Tyler Veerman went to the well to take that third place. He's not going to be disappointed with that effort. Not a chance. All right. No, he'll be very thrilled with that finish. I agree with you entirely. As you can see that this looks like Shadeg right now at the spear throw. And we had, had eyes on Rose Wetzel momentarily. Uh, I don't know where she is in relation to Alex Walker, Chris Roglowski, but it looks like Rose is still in second place. Third place coming through right now. Is that Rhea Koble? Rose is doing exactly what we said we didn't think she would be able to do, which is put the ankle aside, attack a descent. She climbed with Rhea. If she is down at the bottom ahead of her, she climbed at least within range of Rhea and then out descended her. That is astonishing with that rolled ankle. I mean, all hats off to Rose for what she's doing and Rhea's still in it. She's managed to hang on the descent as well. Well, and we know that with the spear throw lurking, this could really go to either of them. And we also know, and I'd like to add, this is important. Rose, even if she does not miss the spear, often takes 30 to 40 seconds to throw it. She really takes her time. And any lead that she has right now is not safe as a result of that. That's exactly and right. I have a feeling she that... has the longest build up to a spear throw. And I have a feeling that I, I mentioned so she, earlier about Alex Walker taking care of business, right? She goes on course, she takes care of business. I have to imagine we're going to have eyes on her soon. And with this gauntlet coming up, we got some failable things. So is first through third on lock? Not quite yet. Not in my opinion, anyways. There's still some shakeup that could happen. Well, Jack Bauer's out on the course with an update for us. And what do you got, Jack? We have some technical difficulties with Jack, so we'll come back to Jack with an update shortly. But right now, we have some athletes coming into the spear throw, it looks like. Now, David, I could be wrong, but over the this is, over Steve's shoulder for a second, I thought I saw Nick Mask run onto screen. And we haven't seen him. We haven't seen the marks. We haven't seen Nick. We haven't seen a lot of our contenders. Is that Sean Stevens' whale, I believe, misses a spear throw here? And that's heads off who that burpees. was, missing that Ryland, spear. we saw miss burpees. And here's Chris Roglowski, fourth position, it appears right now. It's still running, like, very strong and smooth as she comes out of that crawl. But she's got quite a gap between herself and the two women in front. As mentioned before, that spear could still shake things up. But as it stands, uh, it would take a miss there for her to, to steal one of those podium spots. Sharing battle stories after the race is over. It's not much better than that. So Chris Roglowski, again, looking very strong at this point in the race. She, she just continues to impress me with how she has no major weaknesses in her game. Every event she seems to be competitive in in some way. As uh, Ryland Shadeg now making his way in towards the finish for either a fourth or fifth place finish. I didn't. I did not see what happened to Josiah. Did you guys? No, I had no eyes on that. And the interesting thing, or maybe important thing to keep in mind about Chris is that she's now lived at altitude for about two and a half months. Mm -hmm. And that's about- so starting to take effect. Four years less, four years less than Rhea and Rose. So she's battling mm -hmm. two women who have about a half decade lead on the altitude game. Well, one last little ascent for Chris Roglowski, who not only has been competitive in these races this year, including a second place finish, or excuse me, a third place finish in Big Bear, but uh, also managed to steal a uh, High Rocks World Championship while she was at it. And it looks like we did have uh, Josiah Middow there after cross it, uh, you know, past the finish line talking with the guys. So he must, we just must not have had eyes on him. Somewhere in front of Ryland, but not sure on the placing there. 
And I could so be wrong, but it with looked like place we saw finishing. someone in. We saw someone in all gray go through the 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 monkey bars there, which may be VJ Jones. But VJ still maybe squeezing a few points out of this race. That's pretty incredible. But Ryland Shadeg looking completely depleted at this point. And we just saw Botrus hop off the monkey bars with, I believe that was a clinker right behind him. I think that was Jacob Clinker. So we have a whole host of people mixing together that we may not have expected to see together on course. VJ, Botrus, Clinker. I want to describe that feeling that we just had a, a shot of Ryland there doing what you call like the zombie death march to finish the race um, as yes. he, he hones in there. That feeling has to be one of the absolute most satisfying yet worst feelings in endurance athletics. You are telling your body to do something it physiologically can't do anymore. I don't even remember that portion of the race often because you're in such disarray. Like he'll look back on this and the only thing he remembers is because we have video proof. I almost guarantee it because his heart rate is so high. He's maxed out. He's been through lactate threshold way longer than he should have. And he's, he's on damage control right now. And most people finishing that didn't win the race are at that point right now. Every fiber in his body is telling him to stop. The only thing that's keeping him going in his mind right now. What, what's really incredible about this is he really is on empty. He can barely pick his knees up at this point. It almost seems like he's more of a stumble than a run. But that is the slip wall for Ryan Chadeg. And he is being chased right now. He's got to hold off a sprinter. One last kick from Chadeg. Who just made a move Joshua on him Reed. right there? Joshua. That was Reed. Joshua Reed sneaking up to the sixth position, just out of nowhere. All Heck day we don't race. Very similar, race. very similar to his performance in Tahoe at the North American Championships. Closing we late. Like about that. Heat, heat doesn't kill you until it does. One of those, one of those pieces that opens up the door for heat to just assassinate you. There's 30 burpees in the sun at the end of a really long race where Ryland went from hurting mm -hmm. to decimated with one missed spear. You could see it when he missed it. He bent his head down over the railing and just looked absolutely destroyed. And then the breeze finished that off. Well, right now you got Chris Rogloski eyes on her right now, pushing towards the finish. But the question is, where are our leading women? Emma Cook Clark. Well, that's a great question because I have not the women seen in a while. Women only start women only start roughly about five minutes after the men. And if Emma's as fast as we think she's gonna be, she's gotta be in that finishing gauntlet here now because we predict her maybe to be in the top ten or fifteen of the overall men time. So she gotta be getting close. Well, I believe our rabbits are about to have eyes on some of the women coming into the festival area, at least your Emma Cook Clark, Rose Wetzel, and uh, Rhea Koble. I think we but have on this descent right now, and you can see just how long this descent is. Oh, a bad ankle roll there, unless that was a rock rolling out for Chris Trigloski got caught on camera there. She's doing pretty well. Yeah. She's looking pretty solid still. So and as Chris makes her way to the finish again, I was pointing out the length of this descent. What was that, Bracken? Second and third, Rhea and Rose, I believe, are on a carry at the same time right here. They're going to finish up a carry and head down by the tape past us. And I believe that they are still relatively close to each other. Well, here's Emma Cook-Clark, your women's race leader. And again, we spoke about wire-to-wire. -wire. This is an incredible wire-to-wire -wire performance. And you just have to hope for her that she holds these clean races together. We saw her with what looked like the opportunity to win in Big Bear. Lost because of a missed spear throw. We saw uh, the failed obstacle in Abu Dhabi. That cost her a second place finish at the World Championships. And instead, she had to take fourth because of that hellish penalty loop over by the, was it monkey bars? It was very difficult monkey bars in Abu Dhabi or some kind of monkey in the middle. Multi-rig. Um, 
But this time, it was at the rig, yes. But this time, Emma Cook Clark looks like she has enough of a cushion that she could even handle a mistake or two. Emma's in that phase of racing where if there was someone who was uh, going to win this race, done the right. talking. Yeah, her legs have always done the talking, but she in the beginning and even now still, you know, if we have perfect course conditions, Emma's Emma's we're gaining confidence in Emma's obstacle ability. And today, although the the heat is there and the grueling course is there, the conditions are very dry, very tacky, very sticky on the obstacles, which leads to very low obstacle failure. So there wasn't much on paper that could get in her way today, considering the course conditions. I think she's probably in mm -hmm. between making that jump when we see like a wet, mushy course where then she might we might see some failures out of her. But today, like if you look at the specs, yeah, had Emma written all over it. And Emma Cook Clark again, if there's anyone who was going to add their name to the list of racers winning North American Elite Series races, US Championship Series, National Series races, whatever the title of that series may be. We have not had one that was not named Nicole Miracle or Lindsay Webster in uh, 1,500 days. It, it should be Emma Cook Clark. When we look at what her talent level is, where she's been finishing in races for the last year, she is the one athlete that that is truly at that level, in that echelon, where she could take down a Lindsay Webster at any given time. Two things Bracken, to point to out. Piggyback one on screen, one off. You'd said. Oh. <laughs> You're going to say exactly what I was going to say, Bracken, so you just go and say it. I'm not sure, but I know this, this delay here is killing us, Kirk, you and I. But Emma <laughs> has the opportunity to coast this race out. She had no reason to run that that bucket. And she is. That's that's not a decision that many people have at this point. She's over two hours into a race, and she's deciding to run with the bucket up and downhill, which is spectacular. The second is that Chris Roglowski is off cam, but we can see her. And she is doing a hop consistently down this mountain where every single time she plants her left leg first, it's always the same gallop. And that's what you do when you have an ankle sprain. You have to quick get your bad ankle onto the ground and then take the brunt of it with your other ankle. So we have two women now in the top four dealing with a bum ankle going down the mountain. And our rabbit, yeah, exactly of course, right. Robert Killian. This is... And uh, we, I don't know if you guys heard, uh, viewers dangerous. heard this, but one of the uh, one of the uh, camera guys he snuck in his audio and it said, "I'll limp down the course with you." You could hear the audio, and we were following Chris. Um, don't know if you caught that or not. So it sounds like indeed Bracken those couple of spills or trips uh, got her ankle because the cameraman uh, audibly, I believe, it was on Chris when when I heard the audio come in say, "I'll limp down the hill with you." But right now, um, she seems to be hanging in there. She's holding it together, but we've seen a number of limps out of Chris Roglowski right now. She, her descending pace has slowed to what I would consider to be more of an almost jog for a descent from her. The, the, the power isn't mm -hmm. there on the foot-to-ground power. Not the way you see Emma Cook-Clark running this flat right now, even with all the, the grass and stuff in her way and the, the odd terrain. She's still running faster than Roglowski is on this harder-packed descent. And that tells you how Chris is feeling yeah. right now. And you heard the the rabbit there. Uh, Steve called out to him something, and and his Killian responded, "No, I'm good. I'm good. They have me on right now." So, <laughs> Steve was even offering to take the the camera so that he could run because of how bad Killian's ankle is. And Killian said, "No, I'm on camera. I'll just keep going." So, this field is getting ankles left and right. Brad, to descend you won a number through of rock and rubble is I really hard, especially. What was that, Kirk? I was going to say, I was going to say, Bracken, you back in the day used to win races by a good bit. You're one of the OGs, Bracken. You blow the field away, embarrass them. Now, at this point in the race, if you put your mind, like put your your mind in Emma's body here, like what are you thinking at this point in a race? If you're Emma Cook Clark and you're clear of the field, like what are you enjoying it? Are you still pressing? Like what's what's going through her head? Do you think? If she was anything like me back in the day, 
When she's out of sight in the woods, coming up to the last gauntlet, you catch your breath and then you try to put on a show in the last quarter mile. So she's pressing now because if you want to win, you want to win looking good. That's why she, you saw her bounding down the hill, running hard in and out of these obstacles. She's putting her statement on this victory. Little and I want to ask you guys, so we have not seen second and third for quite a while. So my question to you is, when they emerge, who do you anticipate is going to be in the lead there? Rose Wetzel or Rhea Coble? Because they were essentially deadlocked once again, as they have been for half the race. What? Honestly, I think Jack Bauer has some eyes on here. If we could go over to him, he's got something to tell us. We don't have audio with Jack, unfortunately. But what he's saying right now. We can get now eyes on the camera Rhea, on the athletes. Rhea and Rose are right there. And I believe Rhea is still ahead of Rose. Coming off of It looks rope like climb. they're both on the rope climb at the same time, if that was correct. Jack, give us a thumbs up if Rhea is ahead of Rose. That must thumbs down. Oh, there we have it, fellas. Easy answer. <laughs> so, so Rose is ahead of Rhea. So, if Chris is in sight, we're just gonna have to wait and see, guys. Because right now, Emma Cook Clark is putting her stamp on this thing. She is really stretching out that lead. She is the only racer left in the field that is truly attacking this final section of the course. It looked like Rose Wetzel was just kind of hanging on for dear life the last time we saw her. And that's what a course like this does to you, is even the descents are exhausting because of how steep and technical they are. Who wouldn't hang on for dear life at the end of a course like this? This course is brutal. Now they're dealing with 80, 85 degree heat blowing on them. They've been out there forever. Even saw Emma Cook Clark on both of the last water stations. Uh, she stopped and took her time. I mean, those are two water stations in 10 well, that, minutes, and she took her time to drink. We are now looking at Rose Wetzel descending and now ascending with that sandbag. And right behind her, that's Rhea Koval. So we are still deadlocked. And while it did appear that on the rope climb itself, Rose was slightly behind, she comes off of obstacles so quickly. We've seen that over and over her ability to just get back up to speed because she's got those snappy track legs. Reyes, of course, you know, that little locomotive, she has to slowly get those wheels going again. She doesn't have that acceleration. But still, look at the no, two of them absolutely right. seconds apart. And Rose, Rose is so strong out of obstacles. So Reyes' chance to win this is to get into every obstacle with no hesitation. And really, she's got to get that spear throw out of her hands quickly. You usually don't wanna rush something like that, but Rose is going to spot you 15 to 20 seconds and you can push that lead. And we just saw, speaking of spears, that's a hit from Emma Cook Clark. It was high and right, but it's stuck. And now look at the two of these two. Again, watch that stretch away from Rose Wetzel, just that ability to gap instantaneously because she gets up to speed so quickly. And Rhea Coble's gonna have to do something that she's not accustomed to doing, and that's pressing the downhill, and that's just being willing to send it and use it. Because the longer she can stay on Rose, the better her chances. Do we think that the technicality no more of these descents favor Rhea Coble or at least help her a little bit? Because I think on the open descents, we're not as confident in Rhea's ability to descend with some of the best. But right now, she's hanging tough with Rose. Do you think the technicality of some of the parts of this course, as we saw like Chris Roglowski roll her ankle, you think that's helped Rhea descend, Bracken? Yeah, yeah I, right I, now, I look think at her. She slowing just ran Rose right back down, down into it. Rhea looks like Rose right is back looking into again it. on that descent. They're fighting though. This is a fight. These women right. have not backed off each other for two hours. And what and we're Rhea seeing Coble is that a clearly more comfortable on the descent. 
Or yeah, or is that a testament? I would to say Rea's that's one hundred percent Rose's ankle. That that we've now seen Rose limping for the entirety of this descent. She has not been able to open her stride. She's doing that little half step hop for the entirety of this descent. Her best shot is to get to the flat where she can put significant gap between herself and Rhea. But Rhea isn't even running particularly hard on the downhill. She's just allowed to just fall forward. She doesn't have that limitation that Rose has right now. If, if I'm descending and I'm descending like Rhea and I'm actually passing people like significantly, that's a big momentum shift in my eyes for Rhea. I would I would go oh, yeah. into this gauntlet with a lot of confidence um, because running away from people at this stage of the race, knowing you're in second place, momentum is everything. You know those little sparks that fuel you and give you a second surge of energy that you didn't know is there? Rhea Coble has that going into this gauntlet because of her ability to put some time on Rose there due to the ankle. So I kind of like how Rhea is sitting here. Even if Rose is faster on the flats, technically, I think – um, Ray has been ignited a little bit by that pass. I would be if I were in her shoes. Absolutely. And that's a significant gap. That's not, it's nothing to scoff at. I just got an update that in the men's race, final finishing position, BJ Jones is in 11th position at the finish line. So uh, not the day he hoped for, I'm sure, but BJ Jones uh, has finished the race and uh, he's going to hope that he doesn't need to use that those points in his series rankings. Well, Rhea Coble now has an entire obstacle lead on Rose, and Rose isn't making up time on this section of the monkey bars yet. Now Rhea's off running, free and clear, just lengthening the time. We need to see Rose get off an attack here. She lost a little bit of step there. This is looking like it's Rhea's to lose at this point. It is. Look it is this. absolutely looking like a Rhea race right now. But that's what? Reglosky. Now in the in the race again, and you have two women on bum ankles competing for that third podium position. As Emma Cook Clark has just crossed the finish line and claimed the victory, Emma Cook Clark, first place. We now have a new name to add to the record books of winners of North American Elite Series races. And Emma Cook Clark, you are on that list. Congratulations to you. As now the big battle is the bucket carry. Rhea Koble, Rose Wetzel, and Chris Roglowski, all three with a chance for second place. I don't know how Roglowski did it, but she is right there again. You know, about an hour ago, I said, Chris, I'm just going to say it now. Chris is going to get to the bottom in second. And then about a half hour ago, I realized I'm an absolute fool. She's out of this race. And now here she is again. <laughs> <laughs> about to make a pass into third place and she still has a chance to take second today this is outrageous racing and i think and i think rose wetzel is having clearly an issue with that ankle again because she is no longer pressing the way that she was even just a few minutes ago there's no fault to rose here at all i think she's at the point in the race mm -hmm. now where the effort is catching up with her and she's dealing with the ankle. When you start to see how slow she was going, like how much time even Rhea put on her in transitions in and out of like the monkey bars, for example, that screams to me, that doesn't scream to me ankle as much as it screams to me. Like I'm bleeding out right now and I'm, I'm hurting. And so I think that you're, you're kind of getting the perfect storm as you should at this point in a race, if you've raced it hard. And so I think you probably got a little bit of that going on. Yeah, for sure. And it's important to remember that when you have an ankle or something that's in your lower half that's giving you issues, it's not just about limping. Everything around it has to tighten up and take extra strain onto it. And you add in a 13-mile course with thousands of feet of vert at altitude with heat, like we've drummed into your head all day long, those other muscle groups and stabilizers really can't afford to do all this extra work and it just leads to running out of gas sooner than you normally would because you can't possibly be efficient when you're trying to brace your leg and limp well right here Rhea Coble still in second position she's made the blind corner wait still looking very smooth as she hits the atlas stone Now, who's going to be next? Is it going to be Chris Roglowski? 
I see Rose Wetzel just hitting the Z wall right now. And Chris is around the blind corner. Doesn't do, yeah, doesn't do any favors to either of those athletes uh, on the Z wall. That can be a lot of torque on the ankles, but they both look clean. Well, Rhea copel has got a little gap here, and she's going to need it. She's going to need to get lucky, I think, at least with some maybe a little help on the spear throw. Because that is coming up, and, and we know what this. that does to the women's races historically. Ray is running with purpose right now. This is probably the most open we've seen her stride. So she's aware of what's happening behind her. And keep in mind, anyone watching at home, that these volunteers and course officials are giving people updates. The entire time that Tyler Veerman was in second place, it wasn't just, oh, I hope I can catch first. It was, he's got a 90 minute second lead on you. He has a two minute lead. It's two and a half minutes. It's 250. He's getting those updates and it's negatively impacting his adrenaline. Rhea and Chris are both having those same updates. They know what's happening. And so Chris is feeding off it, but Rhea is at least aware that her lead is shrinking. Not that we now. I, I want to game say, of what if noting noting but, Rose Wetzel's ankle right now. It, it is clear that her ankle is causing huge problems for her right now. If, if we talked about Tyler Veerman running the most painful race of the day, but I think that now goes to Rose Wetzel, who is looking like she's in absolute agony on every step at this point. Not, not that we like to play the game of what if, but I'm going to play the game of what if. Um, you know, it's been a few years since we've seen Rhea Coble at the front end of this women's field in these competitive races. She's had other endeavors. Um, she's been pursuing like schema and some other types of racing, but what if Emma Cook Clark wasn't in this race guys? Like think about the, like the implications, like we're, we're starting to see maybe like Rhea Coble of old sort of come back as she's gone through her health journey and then, um, pursuing other sort of loves in sport, but to see this out of Rhea Coble, uh, it's pretty satisfying considering I've I've kind of, you know, witnessed her journey over the last like five or six years. Like this is sort of a statement piece, fellas. I don't know what you think, but it, it's pretty impactful in my mind as far as Rhea's prowess. Oh, there's no question. And uh, it's great to see her beginning to, to reestablish herself. But I think a lot of that is just confidence. We haven't seen her attacking a course like this in probably three or four years. And at the same time, what does it say about Rose Wetzel? If we think back to when Rhea was at her best, the type of mountain beast that she is and was, we never in a prediction show would have said, and I think Rose is going to challenge her on this two and a half hour altitude mountain course. That wasn't even in the cards. That wasn't <laughs> a possibility. And yet here it is with a bad ankle, Rose made it 12 and a half of 13 miles with her. And it's not over yet is the other thing. I mean, this is – Chris Roglowski is saying it's not over either, and she is clearly limping as well. Like, she is not running with that open stride that we normally see from her. It looks like her hamstrings are tightening up on her a bit as well, but she is so tough. This is all grit at this point. If you had to – Kirk, if you had to say which of these athletes feels the best right now, You'd say Rhea, correct? Uh, well, Emma Cook Clark is already, you know, two Gatorades <laughs> deep, so she's oh. probably feeling pretty good right now. Uh, but other than her, I'm going to say Rhea Coba right now. She's got the momentum on her side, and she's got she's only been picking her way up through the field. And then I would say second would have to be Chris uh, going on the hunt. But I, I, yeah. it's pretty close between those two. They both have a lot to fight for right now. They do end up. And this is such a great battle because Rhea is known as currently the best ultra OCR athlete on the planet. And no one runs more 100 milers than Chris Roglowski. So you have two women who don't fade, but, but, but they're both at the end of a really hard, tough race and they have some things plaguing them. So both women have been in br more brutal spots than this. So you can't really bank on either of them having this, oh, I'm just too tired. I don't know how to deal with this. They've done this for 24 hours. It really is going to come down to someone's going to have to capitalize on an obstacle because in between on the flats, 
they seem to be too well matched. Well, Bracken, it's interesting you say that because we are at the spear throw right now, and there's really only about 10 to 15 seconds between these two athletes as Chris makes that savvy move, runs past Rhea to the next one over. I always like that move because it might disrupt their rhythm a little bit if they're getting ready to throw. You let them know that you're here. Is that a miss? Did we get a hit or a miss there out of Rhea Koble? It's hard to say. All right, well, it looks like we might have lost some of the audio here, but we got a looks like a miss for Chris and Rhea. Now here's an opportunity for Rose, right? Like we can throw this, this ankle deal out of the window if, uh, if she can <laughs> stick this. I'll be honest, I missed both of I missed both of those throws, guys. I lost my visual for a moment, uh, and I have it back, and it looks oh, like Rose goodness. Wetzel is just is she about to steal this? She is. <laughs> there is that was the that quickest I've seen Rose be... Wetzel throw a spear in recent history, uh, too. Uh, Ankle, spear Well, it's not over yet, Rose. You still got a quite a ways to run. But wow, what a <laughs> performance right now. What an opportunity. The door is open for you. Can she push that pain aside? I she think can. at this point that pain has numbed itself out, right, Bragan? There is no greater pain reducer on the planet than sticking a spear throw as your opponents are doing burpees. <laughs> I've competed in a lot of different sports, Kirk. And never once in my life have I had a mind and body numbing adrenaline rush, like nailing a spear to seal a victory. It's just outrageous that she's done wow. that. She kept herself in it. Well, Rose, she's going to have to battle home now. But that limp seems to be slightly gone. You can see Rhea Koble's now on the hunt again. And it's, it's so not that big a gap. I mean, we're probably breakfast. talking 30, 40 seconds. So hard to run fast after yeah. burpees. You have what burpees did to you versus a bad ankle. Like, which one's worse? I don't know. But right well, now we're going to find Rhea out. Rhea looks fast. Rhea looks fast in that first clip we saw of her. And she's into the mud. Chris. And that's Chris Roglowski also looking smooth. Oh, this is so brutal. Rolling mud is This is such a close obstacle. Out. And yet it is so miserable when you're trashed. Because it's like it's like being in a bad dream, where there's something right ahead of you. You and just you can't get out chasing you, and you you can't move fast enough. Well, if Why we cut that? over that right now to line. Rose Wetzel, she is moving fast. Rose Wetzel is hammering right now. This is her opportunity. I think she just passed Toby Cole right there. That was an OG high five, and Rose Wetzel now one last little ascent. She looks like she's in so much pain. She's using her arms to try and run this thing home. Yeah, but yeah, if you, you remember how the gentleman looked running up this hill, she's running as strong now. She's she's running on gusto now. This is the track in her coming out. You rarely in OCR see someone go to their arms to finish off a race. But she is absolutely thrashing away with her upper body. And every single one of these three women had the opportunity to put their stamp on the race and have their narrative be the story. Rhea was either back with a runner-up finish, or Chris gets back-to-back -back finishes, or Rose is back with a runner-up finish. They all had that chance, and Rose is the one in the driver's seat now. But look at her fight. She's almost power-walking. Now, I want to point out as well, again, second place gets $2,000, third place gets $1,000, fourth place gets $800. So a miss there for Chris Roglowski may have cost herself $1,200, one spear throw. You see Rhea checking back constantly now. You know what? That's a sign of boys, don't you? That's a sign. Those legs She's are hurting. blown up, and she is, she is on <laughs> borrowed time, Rhea. Hang on, girl. 
All right, she's had two glances back so far that I have seen. So she wants to know, can I take my foot off the gas just a little bit? Just a little bit. But the answer is no, Rhea, you can't. you got to keep pressing right now. Big Bear and Utah over. are the two cruelest courses because you do all of this climbing, all this descending. You get back down to the festival grounds. And then they loop you up and around it one time. And you have this little tiny incline of vert that you discard before the race as it even being a thing. You just think I get to the bottom and I kick to the finish. And suddenly you're reduced to this stumble crawl hike at a grade that any other time in your life you'd just be running on. It's so unfair and brutal. Well, right now it looks like we have Rose Wetzel sighting. Rose Wetzel, if we can get to that. That shot may have just reached the finish line. And it looks like Rose Wetzel's going to hold on for second place. What an absolutely thrilling finish for Rose Wetzel to steal this race. And now, as she hits the slip wall, can Rhea Koble finish this thing out? It's dry. It shouldn't be slippery at all. And just moments ahead of Chris Roglowski, but and a great effort from Chris, but Rhea Koble is going to hold on for third place here in Utah for the Spartan Elite Series. Completely gassed. She looked back three or four times towards the end of that race. What a showing. And who would have thought, like you said, Bracken, that we'd see Rose Wetzel and Rhea Koble on the same podium of a two-and-a-half-hour mountain race? In our episode this week, Kirk, we talked about who runs the most painful race. And we usually say second place or fourth place. Well, today the answer is all three of these women ran the most painful race. <laughs> Rhea, Rose, Chris, they went to a place that the average human being doesn't get the opportunity or the misfortune to ever experience. And they are not going to forget this battle for the rest of their lives. I know. Any one of them, had they been a minute apart, two minutes back from each other, would never have experienced the level of misery that they experienced battling each other for the last two hours. It feels like the old guard sort of have made their mark here. The old guard like put their feet back down on the ground. I mean, of course we have Emma Cook Clark winning the women's race, but you know, as a 39 year old man myself, I gotta give a fist bump, right? To uh, Rhea Koble and Rose Wetzel. Old guard, still relevant. Absolutely. That's cool. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have Steve Hammond uh, right now heading down to go chat with some of our uh, race winners. Steve, uh, who do you got with you? <laughs> well guys, thanks, we are live with the girls. Holy smokes, I'm going to start with Emma Cook Clark. Emma, you had a phenomenal race. You've just done a couple of sky races, mountain courses. How did this compare with that? I mean, in some ways it was similar. It was a lot of climbing and descending. Um, it was hot. So that was uh, like the challenge as well as the elevation here. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't super different, but the obstacles certainly change it. Um, and just the, like the amount of, of running versus vertical. Today. And most of all, you didn't stop smiling out there. You loved it, didn't you? Most of the time, I loved it. Yeah, it was, it was tremendous. It Congratulations, was Emma. Good you. Clark, your Thank women's you. champion. But holy smokes, you ladies <laughs> gave us an absolute yeah. show. That was incredible. That was Rose, you had no idea that you were in second place when you hit the spear. So Ray and I went back and forth for second for a lot of the race. And then uh, at the very end, we see we see Chris creeping um, back on us, which is not surprising at all because her, her, her uh, endurance is amazing. Um, but yeah, I know Ray is strong in, in every capacity, so she kept me honest the whole time. I know even even when I pulled ahead at some point, I was like, I know she's on me, and there's no way she's giving up. Well, guys, your top four right here. That was an incredible race, ladies. You are amazing. Well done out there on a brutal, brutal course. Thank you very much. Back to you guys. How much did Emma win by? Uh, I'm not sure. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Congratulations to Chris for her fourth place finish, and Rhea for third, Rose on her second place podium finish. And it's incredible how close together they were at the end. It all coming down to a spear, of course. But uh, we're going to uh, kind of recap a little bit. I'd like to talk about 
What I found so interesting about today was how similar the men's and the women's races really played out. You had one wire to wire winner who streaked away. And then you basically had three to four athletes who just leapfrogged each other back and forth for the entire race to the point that we had no idea who would finish second and who would finish fifth in either of those races because it could have been a complete shuffle. And if you were to play that race over three or four times, you'd have three or four different finishing orders. So, uh, Bracken, party thoughts. Thoughts about how things shook out today. Let's start with the men's race. Well, we talked about dominance, right? We talked about how the winners of both races were dominant. Hawk Call crested the top with about a three minute lead. He won by one minute and 36 seconds. Emma Cook Clark won by 13 minutes and 21 seconds. So I know we're talking about the men right now, but while there were dominant wins on either side, there are levels to dominance. And maybe the men's field was arguably deeper with world champions not winning. We didn't have another world champion in the mix unless you call Count Rhea as an ultra world champion, which I think you can. But one minute and 36 seconds by hawk call and still looked dominant doing it he did and and i would add w let's pull up the men's leaderboard because uh hawk call was the only man who cracked two hours today um and he an hour 59 and 14 seconds so he beat atkins by like you said about minute 36 and then to veerman it was less than a minute back and then the gap started forming josiah Midow was it almost four minutes back from Tyler Veerman after being right up against him going into the final descent. Ryland Shadeg, another three minutes back to him. He just squeaked it out over Josh Reed. And then again, you're looking at an over another minute back to Sean Stephen Wales, almost another minute back to Batris, another four minutes back to Brett Hales, another three minutes, three and a half minutes back to Nick Matz. So these gaps, when you talk about the length of this race and how steep the climbs and descents are, you get these opportunities for these massive spreads to happen. And I think you're 100% right when Bracken, when you talk about how we did not have the champions, the world champions in this field to challenge Emma Cook Clark, but certainly the women's depth was on display when you look at positions two, three, four, five. Uh, we got one amazing show uh, for both the men's and women. So Kirk, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, it's a brutal race when you see time gaps between 1 and 10 on the men's side be 19 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we have a pretty deep field out there, and we have a lot of talent. Uh, Emma Cook Clark on the women's side, she's the exception, not the rule. That's how talented she is. But on the men's side, seeing those time gaps just tells us exactly what we thought. History repeated itself in the sense that Utah delivered with the conditions, with the duration. You see these big gaps form as people fall apart. When they fall apart, they crumble. And that's why we see these big time gaps. And I would like to say, like, when you look at this, I would say my MVP on this list of men, um, I know the North American champs, Joshua Reed, had a great race, but it was a diluted field. This year's a pretty stacked field, and Joshua Reed comes in sixth place. He's one that stands out to me, as well as, uh, of course, Hawk Call winning and putting his exclamation point on the men's race. Absolutely. And we've got now our top four women in because we have oh, on the leaderboard, we're going to throw it up there. We have not had another women's finisher yet that we're aware of. Um, and again, you look at that 13 minute gap from Emma Cook Clark back to the rest of the field, but then those other three racers all within 60 seconds of one another. And that is, you're talking about a two hours and 34, two hours and 35 minutes of running and it's 60 seconds separating three people. That is, unbelievable as here we get an alex walker sighting and alex walker is hurting today this is a tough day she is all business so this is a painful way to run for fifth huh just brutal and heat altitude well they won out because alex is not a quitter and she hasn't quit and she is a fit athlete who I would argue is as fit as she's been. And we've seen her top five at the Tahoe World Championships. But this is just a brutal beatdown of a course on a hot, hot day. Well, you know, we always say Utah in July, not going to be a cool day. Uh, 
Alex Walker is tough. She has managed to put herself in top five podium contention in national series races at almost every event she's run. And here she is again doing just that. It's an, it's not her prettiest race, but they rarely are when they're out in the mountains. Alex Walker is going to be really proud of her performance today. Whether or not she's pleased with fifth place, she looks very tender right now coming to the finish. There's that, that I think, famous phrase, Kirk, you've mentioned it on the podcast before, you win or you learn. I think that these women here, second through fifth, had they went to school today. They learned a lot that they're going to use moving forward in Blue Mountain, in Kelowna, and probably in Dubai this, or in Abu Dhabi this year. This was a learning experience, both about how to race in this and also about who they are when the chips are down because the chips got down for everyone second through five today. Yeah. You know, I got what I wanted today. I got what mm -hmm. I wanted today in the sense that, uh, oh, never mind. We got an interview coming oh, with Hawk call. Yeah, might as well take this. Hey well guys, I have today's winner. The, uh, the quite awesome Hawk call. Um, on your home course here in Utah, you did this race last year and you went right out of the gate. And um, but you came back this year and you went even harder, which was surprised me because you crashed last year. However, what does this mean to you, Mr. Hawkall? Oh, I am your thumbs on the beyond camera. happy with this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm beyond happy with this. I after last year, I was like, all right, the finishing. For one, it doesn't have a tire flip, so I'm not going to pass out, basically. I was like, and for two, I'm a lot stronger than I was last year. I was like, I've been working on this. And so going into this one, I was like, I'm going to take out even harder. And I'm going to make that gap as big as I possibly can going into that last descent. And I was like, and this time, no matter what, I'm not going to let Atkins pass me. And every single steep hill I got to, I was like, this is the one. I was like, this is when he's going to catch me. And I was like, just go, just go, just go. And I, I mean, I did not relax at all until... I was on top of that wall at that finish. I was like, that was the first time in the entire race. And I was like, okay, I did it. I did it. I was like, I relaxed. I smiled. That's it. Well, maybe these guys will be popping right back in, huh? Looks like we lost the gentleman here at the end, but just waiting to sign out. All right. Well, since these gentlemen aren't popping back up, we've had some uh, connectivity issues. Uh, appreciate all you guys tuning in today and watching. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm left satisfied. We had races to watch on both the men and women's side. Uh, oftentimes, we can see some big gaps form in these long mountain races leading to anticlimactic finishes, but we had races, four podium spots throughout. I'm satisfied. Bracken, we got you back to sign off. How are we feeling about the races? Prior to this race, I said that this was the, the venue that I was most excited for so far this year. And like you, I am satisfied. We got a dominant blowout by Emma. We saw who she can be. We saw such a redemption story for Hawk Call. And then we saw nothing but brutal back and forth battles, second through, on our viewfinder, fifth. 
it was everything a race fan, a commentator, uh, just a, a believer in the sport of OCR wants to see out of a North American spotlight race. It really was. And, and I'd like to add that it felt like a fitting sequel to last year's race at this venue where you really got to start to tell this narrative, especially on the Hawk Call story, to then have this essentially exactly sequel come back through where he has his second shot to do the exact same thing. It's almost like playing the story right over again, except this time we have a different finish. And uh, you couldn't be happier for that guy, of course. And also for Rose Wetzel, for uh, Rhea Koble to have their opportunities to really star today, to, to get those podium spots that, you know, the door was open, as we said in the beginning, and they walked through it. Yeah, and what this also gives us is it gives us uh, some big stake at hands moving forward. We've created legitimate battles in the point series based on the men's finish, definitely with uh, VJ Jones finishing back and Atkins finishing up in second. Um, Emma stealing a bunch of points on the women's side and then the back and forth between like Rose, Chris, Rhea, um, Alex. It just means there's going to be big stakes at the next one too. Everybody showed up and kind of took care of business today for the most part. But it means there's no shoe in yet to who wins. And I like that. Well, so if we look at the women's overall leaderboard, and we don't have the updated scores yet, but coming into today, Lindsay Webster was the outright leader, of course. But if you look into positions from there, it was Chris Verglosky second, Alex Walker third, Rose Wetzel fourth, and Rhea Coble sitting in eighth, with Emma Cook Clark in fifth. You're going to see a huge jump from Emma Cook Clark up the leaderboard. You're going to see a massive jump from Rose Wetzel from fourth, possibly to third, or even second, depending. And Rhea Coble is going to make a move up the leaderboard from eighth. All of a sudden, the women's field, it's anybody's game going into the final race. And this last race is really going to matter. You guys summed so it up ahead. great. But before we, before we look ahead, as a fan of the sport, can I just say that it gave me goosebumps watching Hawk Call get interviewed? I know he's his own man, and I don't want to overplay the Hobie Call uh, card, but man, that was watching Hobie. His voice, his inflections, his, his personality, that was watching Hobie. And Hobie was the dominant force for seven, eight years in this sport. This might just be chapter two. You talked about this was the sequel to Utah. This might just be the sequel of the early 2010s. It's it's distinctly possible. And, and if that's the case, I think everybody has a lot to be worried about because uh, Hobie Call, his one, uh, the one thing that works against him is that he's, his true dominance was before this sport reached its absolute peak. But even when it did, when he came out and raced, he was still Hobie Call, just like we remembered him. And if you have now a version of him who's only in his early 20s, you, everybody's in big trouble because this guy's going to be around for the next 10, 15 years. Yeah, and I think we hope to see, you know, these up-and-comers with longevity potential in this sport. Um, a lot of times athletes find the sport in their 30s or their late 20s, or early 30s, after they've maybe checked the boxes of other endurance sports and then they stumble upon this one. We got some legitimate young humans out here crushing it on both sides. Like we've been asking for new blood. Well, I think we have it now. And I think it's being repeated time and time again through these series races this year. Again, today was no surprise. We have young blood on both sides. So like, I just like, I like what this means for the future. The old guard or the old dogs don't have this thing on wrap. And have they ever, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's just very going to be very fun to watch play out. Now, for those of you guys at home, uh, we want to thank you first and foremost for joining us for this opportunity to bring back Spartan Race live broadcast. It's our first time doing this in years, so thank you all for being patient with us as we've tested new software, new hardware, and a new means of going back and covering this race for you. We hope that you've been able to enjoy this presentation. I've had a great time working with you once again, Bracken and Kirk, um, so thank you all as well as big thanks to Steve Hammond, the trail master himself, and Jack Bauer, the king of stats, out on the course, helping to provide us with those live updates. Uh, thank you to Jason Dupree for producing today, and to Will Hicks and the OCR Report. 
and to Spartan Race. Thank you all again. We will see you guys in Kelowna for the North American Championship Beast, August 27th. And then we'll wrap up coverage of the North American Series, Elite Series, in October. So see you all then in August.